This is the Jocko Podcast Civil War Excursion, number six, with J.D. Baker and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, J.D. Good evening, Jocko. <clears throat> At 3 a.m., I was aroused from my deep sleep by an officer from Washington entering my tent, George Meade wrote to his wife, and after waking me up, saying he had come to give me trouble. At first, I thought that it was either to relieve me or arrest me, and promptly replied to him that my conscience was clear, void of offense toward any man. I was prepared for his bad news. He then handed me a communication to read, which I found was an order relieving Hooker from the command and assigning me to it. Meade's account suggests an equanimity that may have been more imagined than real. According to the messenger, James A. Hardy, Meade at first became much agitated. He protested that John Reynolds should have been chosen instead, that he, Meade, was totally arrogant, ignorant of the positions and dispositions of the army he was to take in charge, and that it would only make sense for him to refuse the assignment. Hardy patiently explained that all of Meade's arguments had already been taken into consideration and the president's decision was final. As Meade absorbed this, some of his dry humor returned. Well, I've been tried and condemned without a hearing, he told Hardy, and I suppose I shall have to go to the execution. (laughs) So that right there is an excerpt from the book Gettysburg by Noah Andre Trudeau. Kind of bringing uh, the union leader for the Battle of Gettysburg, we've heard his name a bit already, General George Meade, how he ended up taking command. Uh, I know this, JD, this, this is, this is kind of your, your recommended book for Gettysburg. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to read one, I know you've read 50 books about Gettysburg, but if you're going to read one, this is a good one to start with. Yeah, I mean, I think we got like, what, like uh, like 10 books like out here in front of us <laughs> on Gettysburg. Uh and, and, you know, and, and I haven't, like, officially walked through and, like, counted how many books there are written on Gettysburg. But I would probably speculate that there's more books written on that piece of dirt than any other piece of dirt in the United States uh, of Gettysburg. And uh, of all the books, you know, I, I've read a ton. And I, this is, uh, yeah, if, if I was going to go and I was going to get one book. Uh, to read on on Gettysburg of the overall battle. Mm-hmm. So I'm not. So now we can't talk about like individual people at the battle. This is like the overarching book of all the events that took place at Gettysburg. This is the go to uh, by Trudeau. Uh, it is a uh, to me, man. You know, it's an it's an easy read. Mm-hmm. How many pages is this bad boy? A few hundred, five hundred. Yeah, maybe six hundred pages. Uh, so getting to the story here, Meade's getting selected as commander. Again, he's thinking he's getting relieved. I mean, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, knock on the door. He thinks he might be getting relieved. Instead, he's getting selected as the commander. First of all, is he the first draft pick? He mentioned some other. Like, what about Reynolds? What, you know, Where is he at? Why is Hooker getting relieved? What's, is he the first draft pick? Why isn't it Reynolds? What's going on? Yeah, uh, I mean, and, and of course, you know, Meade is not, he's not the, he's not the first draft pick. Um, Reynolds is, I mean, and, and uh, Reynolds and Meade, they're friends. Like, you know what I mean? Like they get along, they, they've been, you know, now we're uh, coming in, we just finished out in May. Now we're coming into June, 1863. Uh, both of them were West Point uh, guys. And, and even if you look at like Reynolds, I mean, Reynolds was like, like the commandant of cadets at West Point. You know what I mean? Like, he's a big deal. Uh, he's also a Pennsylvanian, uh, but so is Meade. Uh, well, Meade was uh, Meade was raised in Pennsylvania. His dad, uh, he was actually born in Spain. Uh, and then, you know, his dad was a foreign dignitary kind of type guy. You know, I, I guess you could, like, put, like, State Department kind of guy. He's over, overseas stuff. So Meade's born overseas, but he's raised 
in Pennsylvania. So they're both Pennsylvania guys. So, uh, you know, just like you talked about it, at, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I mean, nothing good happens after 10 o'clock at night. Like, unless it's like the birth of a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what I mean? Like you get a call. But you're kind of expecting that, you know what I mean? Like, hey, you know what I mean? You know, I'm dilated a certain amount. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take my phone up with me because you could have the birth of a child. That's the only time anything good happens after 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and and Mead, he had written his wife. I mean, that's the cool thing about a lot of the stuff that we capture about this behind-the-scenes stuff that's going on with uh, folks in the Civil War is, you know, back then they, they all write letters home. So he's writing a letter home to his wife and, you know, and Meade, Meade, he, he doesn't get along with Hooker. Uh, you know what I mean? Like he, he's not a, he's not a Hooker fan uh, and him and Hooker kind of get into it a little bit. So he's kind of like basically writing his wife saying, hey, honey, I'm, I may be out of a job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I might be coming home. Like I really don't know what's going to happen. And then there he is, you know, he hits the rack and you know, one of these uh, teenage couriers uh, that we talk about, you know what I mean, comes over, he's got a message, you know what I mean, knocks on his door, comes in, hands him that. And, of course, probably the first thought going through his head is, well, this is it. Uh, you know what I mean? What am I going to do now? Because uh, it wouldn't be the first guy that's been relieved in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and, you know, Meade opens it up and boom. It's from Abraham Lincoln, man, and it's, it's your rodeo now. You're the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and of, of course his first thought is, is well, why me? You know what I mean? Like Reynolds and stuff like Reynolds capable commander, uh, you know, and, and Reynolds was the first draft pick, uh, but Reynolds didn't take it. He turned it down. Um, and of course there's a lot of speculation, uh, that, that is a, about Reynolds of like, why? Yeah, okay, yeah, he was a core commander. You know what I mean? He just wanted to stay with his core. I kind of get that. I mean, we talked about Burnside earlier and some of the other ones. I mean, he was offered it, and he didn't take it. Uh, and I'm sure just like with, you know, if Lincoln, if we go like how he talked to Burnside, and he's like, okay, well, Burnside, if you don't take it, we're going to give it to Hooker. And he's like, okay, I'll take it. So obviously I'm sure that, uh, you know, Lincoln was like, well, okay, you know, John Reynolds. He's like, okay, John, well, I mean, if you're not going to take it, I'm, I'm going to put George in. And he's probably like, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm good with George. I, I could only imagine because they're friends. You know what I mean? So I could imagine like Reynolds is like, yeah, hey, mate, he's a good dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, when you look at it, you know, Reynolds, uh, Reynolds, just to, you know, uh, kind of let, uh, you know, some of the folks kind of know about uh, Reynolds, a huge fan of the guy. Um, Reynolds is single. Uh, and when he's out in California uh, before the war, he meets a girl. Uh, and her name's Kate. Catherine uh, is her name. And they decide that, you know, the war kicks off. They're like, hey, uh, you know, after the war, you know, let, they, they plan to get married. And, uh, and he's like, yeah, and if I don't make it through the war, you know what I mean, then you're going to go to become a nun and you're going to join a convent for the rest of your life. So that's kind of the deal that they have. And uh, so she takes his West Point ring which is a big deal, you know what I mean? And then he's got a ring that he's wearing around his neck um, that, that's, that's her ring. Um, and it says, Dear Kate, as inscribed on the inside of the ring that Reynolds is wearing. But nobody knows that Reynolds has a girlfriend. And as they're coming up towards Pennsylvania, you know, Reynolds being from Pennsylvania, he's, his plan is, is as they're on their way into Pennsylvania, He's going to take Kate and he's going to introduce them to his folks and let her kind of meet the family. You know what I mean? They're kind of like secretly engaged. Well, you know, to kind of put you in the content is Kate's Catholic and Reynolds is Protestant. Well, in 1863, it's a big deal. Uh, So that's why they're kind of keeping it like under the wraps mm-hmm. and he's not like telling anybody even his staff guys like most of the, none of these guys know that general reynolds has got a girlfriend and this is again this is just jd kind of you know what i mean when i kind of look at it it's like okay well if i know i'm, I'm gonna go home and i've got like this plan kind of thing and if i stay as a core commander i've got the ability to kind of swoop away and and take Kate and go introduce to the family. If I take this gig as the army commander, I'm probably going to have to cancel my little trip with Kate 
and introducing them to the family. I mean, that's just me kind of thinking mm-hmm. because I kind of put myself in rental shoes. If I've got this plan, I'm going to bring my fiance to come meet the family, and I'm like, but I'm going to get promoted, and it's like that's going to screw up. Like I'm going to have to like start formulating plans, and you know, what I mean, it's going to overwhelm me. I'm taking over a new position, uh, and so I think that had a little bit to do uh, with the fact of Reynolds turning down command. And again, I think that Reynolds is cool with George Gordon Meade being the Army commander. Like, hey, dude, I'll work for that guy mm-hmm. like any day of the week. So uh, that's that's a little bit. You know, we'll talk about like we'll talk about Kate. You know, a little later. You know, instead of getting our head of ourselves, what uh, with General Reynolds. Um, and and Mead, you know, you mentioned Mead doesn't really like Hooker. And one of the things you, you I know when you and I talk about Mead, we always throw the word, you, you always throw the word, like, he's an engineer. Like, this is the kind of personality, you know, you have that stereotypical personality of what an engineer is. This is an analytical person. He's a thoughtful person. He's a cerebral person. And we're going to see that conduct. He has the mindset of an engineer throughout this, throughout the Gettysburg campaign, for sure. Right. Yeah, he's uh yeah, Meade is uh I mean yeah, he's just he's different. Uh but the the thing that you know if you, if you if you pull the string a little bit on on George Gordon Meade, even at the at the start of the Civil War of the battles that we've already discovered, like Meade is the he's he broke Jackson's lines at Fredericksburg. Made it all the way, you know, up the the uh, the river road. Mm-hmm. Could have gotten in and behind. I mean, this dude is is like shows success. Uh, he's not the guy that gets invited to the barbecue on Saturday, man. You know what I mean? Like he's not one of those individuals. He's the fun guy to be around. He's an engineer. He's very methodical. You know what I mean? That's just that's that's just how he's wired. And the cool thing about like Meat is is he doesn't give a shit. Uh, you know what I mean? He just wants to show up, and the dude goes to work. He wants to win. Uh, you know what I mean? And, and he's going to support. You know what I mean? You, you didn't hear anything like we talked about, like some of the other commanders, like undermining, you know, leadership and stuff like that. Like of all the stuff, and I mean, we got another book, of course, laying there. You know, Meet at Gettysburg. Uh, you know, a study of him in command that, you know, and of all the books that I've read, like I've never heard of Mead. Like, yeah, he might be sending a note to his wife kind of saying like, yeah, hey, I really don't like Hooker. OK, good on him. Uh, you know what I mean? That he doesn't like Hooker, but he's still following orders. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? He's still, you know what I mean? Going with the plan. He's not sending folks up to D.C. He wasn't right. jockeying to be next. Which that says a lot about the character of George Gordon Meade. Yeah, that's a positive thing. Um, so uh, last episode we left off at Chancellorsville, uh, the Union had been defeated again. Uh, th- now this is only only a month's gone by. This isn't like some huge, you know. Last episode we don't we're only going a month. Fast forward. Uh, but what's going on? We got Meade now went from division to, to core. Now he's the army commander. Uh, there's also, we were talking about how attrition has impacted these two military forces. So talk to me about how attrition, well, first of all, there's multiple types of attrition, but you know, you can get fired, you can get, you can get uh, killed, you can get wounded. You can get moved. So there's there's things that can happen to an army leader. How is attrition working out for the Union? Uh, I would say that due to attrition, the Union is getting better. Uh, you know, if you look at it at the, you know, the 1860, 1861, when everybody's kind of jockeying for, like, who's going to get a general – you know uh, who's who's going to you know who's going to be in charge? Who's going to get a division? Who's going to be the core commanders and stuff like that? And you know when we talk all the way back and and even on both western side, uh, the western theater and you know the, this eastern theater of the Army of the Potomac that we've been you know chit chatting about uh, over the past time. I mean, if you took a photo of the officers of the Army of the Potomac in in 1861. Meade is like that dude that like have you ever been in like like one of those group photos and and you like you send it to your folks You're like hey yeah, can you see me that's my left ear <laughs> you know what I mean because I'm all the way in the back uh, you know what I mean and like all the other folks like McClellan and Burnside and Franklin and Sumner and all these dudes that like hmm, 
they're not even in the Army of the Potomac anymore. Mm-hmm. They're all in the front. So due to them, like like you said, I mean, there's multiple reasons. You know what I mean? They resigned. They got moved. They got killed. Uh, you know what I mean? They got fired. All of those reasons. Now, if you took a photo of the Army of the Potomac in June of 1863, you're not just seeing like the the left ear of Meade in the back. The dude sit in front row, man, uh, and he's up there with who else? Reynolds, Hancock. You know what I mean? Even you know other guys that you know we'll talk about you know today of of Chamberlain. Uh, you know what I mean? Some of these folks that are just moving up, so they're getting better uh, because finally, like the cream is starting to rise to the top. Uh, and it, you know, it's no joke of, of with me that like I'm a huge Mead fan. I mean, I, I like George Gordon Mead, and it's not just not just because of his actions at Gettysburg, but like throughout the so far in the Civil War, I like John Reynolds, I, I, Hancock. I mean, these guys are proven they they're working their way up. And then you look west, you know what I mean? You got a dude that at this exact time that we're talking about that's going on as they're making this next uh, away game in Pennsylvania before the Battle of Gettysburg. Vicksburg is under siege by that dude who was selling firewood, man, on the streets of St. Louis. That Grant guy, I think he's on a $50 bill now or something. Uh, so probably he must have been banging it. To, and, and where's that other crazy guy, Sherman, that started out the beginning? Remember, we like at the very beginning, we talked about like Sherman, and I was telling the story of him, and they're going in to like get their rank, and he comes out, and he, he's a colonel. And people are like, dude, you could have easily gotten general. He's like, I'll take colonel. I'll earn general. Well, guess what? In 63, Sherman's a freaking general. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the, the cream is starting to rise due to attrition. Uh, yeah. it, we're getting the likes of some of these phenomenal leaders, uh, in, in my opinion, with the, the Union Army. Now, on the other side, for the Confederates, how's attrition working out for them? Well... You know, at the beginning, so again, let's, let's, the, uh, you know, you, you, you peel that back a little bit and you look back in 61. I mean, who was the number one draft pick? Uh, you know what I mean? And, and for Winfield Scott and Abraham Lincoln was Robert E. Lee. So Robert E. Lee, and we talked about like Robert E. Lee, uh, you know, we talked about Buchanan and stuff like that. Everybody, you know, a lot of the varsity folks ended up going uh, with the Confederacy. And if you look at, at mainly uh, the Army of Northern Virginia, there's going to be a change here because at Chancellorsville, as, as we know, uh, Stonewall Jackson uh, ended up dying uh, of wounds received in the battle, uh, you know, some time later. So, Robert E. Lee's got to find her like, okay, who's going to be my, my, my second corps commander. You know, he's still got the old war horse. He's got his first corps. So at Chancellorsville, if you looked at the overall, if you look at the structure of the army of Northern Virginia, you know, you've got first corps, James Longstreet, second corps, Stonewall Jackson, Stonewall Jackson's gone. So you and I would obviously assume that, okay, I'm going to take one of the division commanders and I'm going to promote them up to make them the new corps commander. Uh, so he's got choices. You've got like A.P. Hill. We heard about him. Uh, you know what I mean? At Chancellorsville. Uh, I mean, he could even, if he wanted to, I mean, hell, if I mean, it's Robert E. Lee. He could go get Stewart and say, hey, did you, you did a pretty banging mm-hmm. job as corps commander. Why don't you give up the cavalry? Now, do I think Stewart's going to give up the ponies? Uh, you know what I mean? And go hang out with the infantry. He's like, nah, I kind of did my bid. I'm going back to cavalry. But he could if he wanted to. Right. He could select anybody he wants. Uh, Robert E. Lee ends up, for some odd reason, he's going to create a third corps. And he's going to now have three corps commanders. Uh, so he's going to have Longstreet. Then he's going to have Yule and Hill. So he's going to create two more. So remember, you know, in, in the in the uh, future, in the in the episodes we already kind of talked about at the beginning, you know, they were a very flat organization. Robert E. Lee only had to deal with Longstreet and Jackson, who each of whom he knew very well. Yes. Now it's not saying that like Yule and Hill and some of these other guys. Uh, but they've been operating underneath Jackson. And we kind of talked about how Jackson had trust issues. Uh, you know what I mean? And, and Jackson was very close hold with his information. So, you know, when I kind of look at it, uh, you know, and, and with Stonewall Jackson, um, it seems like he wasn't growing 
for someone to take his place. He wasn't growing the people beneath him. Yes. He wasn't creating subordinate leaders that were ready to step up and take his job. Right. I mean, you know, we've talked at numerous lengths of, you know, number one job of a leader, make more freaking leaders, man. You know what I mean? Make 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 as many leaders as you can. You can't have enough leaders. Uh, and Jackson, I mean, for some odd reason, he, it, it wasn't like clear enough to be like, you would kind of think that like Robert E. Lee would already know, yeah, if Jackson goes down, man, Hill's getting the gig. You know what I mean? Like automatically, no one. Out of the two, yeah, like rack and stack. You know what I mean? Like how it is like modern day in the military. Right. Like you're ranking your people out. You know who's next. Uh, and then, you know, so he's also got this this issue. Okay, yeah, he's got a major victory. It's May. We finished out with the Battle of Chancellorsville. Greatest tank uh, flank attack history of the world. J.D.'s opinion. Uh, and... <laughs> Now he's got to decide of what he's going to do because he's got a boss. So he's got Jefferson Davis. And Jefferson Davis, again, we've got this siege going on in, in Vicksburg. Well, this the siege in Vicksburg of why it's so important, it's going to take you back to the Anaconda plan, that waterborne snake, you know, the Winfield Scott kind of plan. This is like the last little piece. If, if we lose Vicksburg Confederate, the Union's going to control the Mississippi. That, that is, and now they can start that constrict uh, of constricting the South. So Vicksburg is huge. And, you know, uh, and, uh, and Ulysses S. Grant's down there laying the wood to him. Uh, and, and Jefferson Davis is kind of like, okay, yeah, that's great that you kind of dealt with that. Hey, thumbs up, man, on the Chancellorsville thing. Hey, hate to hear about what happened to Stonewall. Uh, you know what I mean? But, you know, who are you going to replace with Stonewall? Who's going to be your corps commander? And I think I'm going to send you down to Vicksburg, man, because – if I send you down there and you can get in the rear and threaten Grant, that's going to relieve the people in, in Vicksburg and, and we're going to keep the Mississippi. So that's that's pretty big, you know what I mean, if you're kind of looking at because you lose Vicksburg, man, here comes that constrictor. Uh, and Robert E. Lee convinces you know his boss, Davis, that, well, how about I go north again, man? You know, if I threaten to the north, that might sway. It's 63. What happens in 64? There's another election. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Some of the former commanders are running on that ticket against Abraham Lincoln, talking about Little Mac. Yeah, McClellan's running against Lincoln, and McClellan politically is like a status quo guy, which we've talked about. And if he wins, probably just like patch things up and we can move forward. Yep. Like, you know, we'll, much easier to figure out. We know where Lincoln is at. Lincoln's right. not stopping. No. McClellan, we could probably get figure out some kind of a deal. We could make this thing work. Yeah. You know? Uh, and Lee, Lee, so Lee doesn't want to go down to Vicksburg. I mean, part of that's got to be just like, hey, bro, I'm from, I'm from Virginia. Bro. I don't want to go down to Vicksburg. I don't want to go all the way over there. Right? I mean, he's, he's from Virginia. He from that area. He doesn't want to leave. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and he's not like a spring chicken either. No. Well, I mean... You know, uh, you know, we talked earlier on the first thing we kind of like, you know, hey, let's uh, get to know J.D. a little bit. And I told you, know, like eight years old, you know, what I mean, first time I go to Lexington, Virginia. And, yeah, that's where the Robert E. Lee, the tomb is and that kind of stuff. Uh, in 63, you know, Robert E. Lee is 56 years old. Now, of course, like back then, like I used to look at like 56, like that dude's in his 50s, man. He is so freaking old. <laughs> Now, sitting across the table from you today, man, like I'm looking at it like Robert E. Lee, man, that dude's in the prime of his life. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all, you know, that kind of perspective of, uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and Vicksburg, uh, you know, if, if, if you ever get a chance to, to go down there, it's the second, probably the second most monumented battle, battlefield military park in the United States. Uh, and it's just amazing uh, the topography of the terrain uh, in and around Vicksburg. It's amazing. And what Grant did down there, Grant Stitch and stuff, I and mean, we could go on about that forever. Uh, we won't. But uh, so he convinces his boss, Jefferson Davis, that I'm, I'm going to go north again, man. You know, now, when he went north again, we covered you know the Battle of Antietam uh, that took place. Uh, that was a draw. Uh, now he's going to – he convinces the boss, I'm, I'm going to go do another away game. Let's get this out of Virginia. Maybe we can help sway that vote coming into 64. We can give some relief 
to the folks in Virginia, because if he leaves Virginia, that means that this army, whoever's in control, whether it's Hooker, me, name it, they got to they got to do something. So they're going to have to leave Virginia and follow me, he's assuming, uh, to be able to protect Baltimore and Washington. So, OK, yeah, it's going to give a relief. Like you said, now we're in 63 and here we are again in Virginia. And that second battle of Chancellorsville, it's Fredericksburg and Chan- man, that region, Spotsylvania County, Stafford County, that whole at Culpeper County, dude. I couldn't imagine being a citizen living during you know sixty one, sixty two time frame, man. Uh, it's just got because you got Union folks there, you got artillery slung around, you got a lot of lead flying horses, mules. You know they got intake, they got exhaust. That's a lot of horse shit, man, in Spotsylvania County. Uh, So they're going to get out and and he's going to do that. But this is the crazy thing, man, is he's going to go three core and he's going to go do an away game. So he's completely changing the playbook, man. Mm -hmm. Like he's been two core. And, you know, as he goes north, if you looked at it like us, like, you know, looking at it like a like a football team, he's seven, oh, and one. Generally, generally, seven oh seven oh Army of Northern Virginia. That 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 one is Antietam. Other than that, you know, with the if you look at the peninsula, you look up, you know, through the battles that have been taking place, man. Robert E. Lee's sitting around right around, you know, seven oh and one, man, and he's going to go do an away game, but he's got a new playbook mm-hmm. of three core. Uh and that now now he can't decide uh, well, is it that he can't decide between Ewell and Hill, or is he just thinking, you know what, it'd be really nice to have another maneuver element? Like, hey, well, why, why, what are the downsides of saying I had two core, two maneuver elements to move around the battlefield, I'm gonna make three? Now, I understand that there's complexities that come with that. I understand that now we got some relationships that aren't as close, but. Did he pl- are the forces plussed up as well? So now he has that many more, pe- a third more people. No, no, no. So all he's doing is basically he's just making smaller core. Got it. Okay. You know what I mean? It's not like he's plussing up to like 200,000. You know what I mean? Like it's he's still right around that same size. Mm-hmm. He's just going to redistribute the numbers. So it's not like it's, you know what I mean? He's still got the same amount of bodies. He's just adding a layer, mm-hmm. which we kind of talked about that with that. You know, when, uh, remember we talked Burnside and he creates these like wing division yeah. commanders and he's just adding layers. So Robert E. Lee literally added a layer. Uh, you know what I mean? And why? Why just pick one? Yeah. You know, then you've still got the old war horse. You know, these two guys have both been with Jackson. You know what I mean? Or pick somebody else. So you got one to hold them, one to skin them. Uh, you know what I mean? You got your two core. It's pretty flat and it's worked. Why are you going to go to what? That's like, you know, you win through the playoffs and then you're going to the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? And you're going to, you're going to completely yeah. change the way you We're fight. We're going to start passing now instead of running. Like right. We made it through the playoffs, running, 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 running. And now we decide we get to the Super Bowl. We're going to, we're going to start throwing the ball. Right. And let, let's bring like three quarterbacks. <laughs> you know what I mean? And just in case we lose two along the way, I got a third. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, so yeah, that, that that's always just kind of, and, and, to be honest, to be honest, brother, I'm like I don't know like mm-hmm. why why he did that. Other than he just didn't have enough confidence that either one of those two individuals could just solely be a core commander. Like, because I mean that is a bump. You know what I mean? Like with any job, even in the military, you know, you start out as a team leader, you got three dudes. You know what I mean? You go to a squad leader. You know what I mean? You got 12 dudes. You go to a platoon commander, man. You got like 30 of them. You know what I mean? And when you first take over, even though it's just like 30 people, you're like, 30 people. That's a lot of people to be like. You know what I mean? But when you've got 30 people, you've got three squad leaders. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's not like you're overseeing. You're overseeing three people. Uh, you know what I mean? And, and that's it. But that's because you trust your squad leaders are taking care of their people. Well, you know, if you've got Jackson, you know what I mean? Was he getting these folks ready, you know what I mean, for that next step up? Uh, and maybe it's got to be that, you know, Robert E. Lee is assuming that, you know what, maybe I should. Because, I mean, I couldn't imagine, like, taking over 15,000 people. Yeah, and especially when he, when Jackson is such a performer. Oh. And now you're looking thinking, which one of these two guys is going to fill his shoes? Neither. 
I'm just going to leave them where they're at, make them peers, and we'll move forward. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. Like, you're looking at the guy's a total stud. Jackson's winning battles for you, like, like unbelievably getting the job done. And now he's gone. And like, oh, shit, who am I going to put in here? Well, you know what? Neither one of them. We'll just kind of keep them neutral. And, and we'll, we'll see how this works out. Yeah, so that's basically, I mean, he's, he's you know, he's going to, right, wrong, or indifferent, Robert E. Lee makes the call. He's going to go do an away game. Uh, and, again, like, you know, we're talking about we finished this out in May. Uh, and, when you know, you're reading about George Gordon Meade, man. This is June. So, like you said, man, this is a month. And, and you know, we're in Spotsylvania, Virginia in May. You know, when you when when we're talking about Meade, when you read at the beginning of the book, when he gets that note, dude, that dude's in Frederick, Maryland. You know what I mean? Like, because like I, I go to Gettysburg, like I've been there a couple of times. Uh, you know what I mean? When I, when I leave my house, dude, it's a two and a half hour drive. You know what I mean? 70 miles an hour. Yeah. I mean, these dudes are walking. It, it's May. You know what I mean? Coming into June. East Coast, wool uniforms. They got all their stuff. You know what I mean? And now they're in pursuit. So when he gets that note, Meade is already in Frederick, Maryland. Robert E. Lee has already, you know what I mean? He's moving up in. So we're in the latter part of June. And Yule is already up, like, threatening towards Harrisburg mm-hmm. and stuff. And and the route approach, remember, you know, we had talked in, in other podcasts. You know, when you, when you look at the Army of Northern Virginia, they got to worry about the logistical train, just like they did before when he was going to go up and they ended up, at, you know, with the, the lost order and they ended up with the Battle of Antietam. Wasn't planned for. Uh, he's got to run his logs up. So the breadbasket of the South is still the Shenandoah Valley. So he's going to run that valley all the way up and then he's going to cross over into that Cumberland Valley in Pennsylvania. Uh, so he's, that's going to be his log train. So that's how he's going to like skirt on the outsides of D.C. and not threaten it. So he's right back over there again towards Shepherdstown, uh, Virginia, which now that we get into 1863, something happened in Virginia. And now you got this new state called West Virginia. Uh, you know what I mean? So, uh-oh, they're not as friendly over there in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Uh, you know what I mean? They, they mm-hmm. actually have West Virginia – has union folks that fight in Gettysburg. What triggered that? Uh, just, you know, it, it's kind of like it's different. Like when you cross over, you know, I mean, I was born and raised, you know what I mean, West Virginia, Virginia, that that whole corridor, big coal mining, uh, big blue collar, a lot of work and stuff like that. You're not seeing farmlands. You're not seeing plantations. You're not seeing that kind of stuff. Uh, over in the West Virginia of what we have today. It's all blue collar. I mean, and it's immigrants that are moving it because it's mining. It's working riverboats. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, they're not necessarily that plantation, white collar, you know what I mean, old Virginia money. These dudes are like being brought over to work for that money in the mines. And, I mean, you could do like a whole – staff ride on just the mining in the Appalachians. Uh, so they're, you know, so they're convinced of like, Hey man, you guys can like join the union. And that's where you go to like, where like Bath County, Virginia is and, and Covington, Virginia. And then you hit that Allegheny there and you get into Greenbrier. That's West Virginia. So that's, that's where you're starting to hit that, that mountainous uh, region of West Virginia, all the way through Beckley, all the way down. Uh, so those guys are convinced, and they they create a state, uh, and they become West Virginia in '63, and they actually stand up you know, regiments and that are going to fight. Uh, you know, right up uh, over on Cemetery Hill is the West Virginia Monuments, right there on the Cemetery Hill. So that quickly, they've already got folks in action. Uh, fighting for the union uh, in 63 so that's a another little change that that kind of takes place but still so robert e lee's going to start running uh and again it's almost the same thing when we talked about at antietam of where you know with antietam hearts and minds like we're, when we enter and we we go to the away game man like we're, we're still we're playing nice with this with the civilian populace up there man uh and 
the the actual the first person like Gettysburg wasn't even really on the map. You know what I mean? Like Gettysburg is just like a small little town, but it's got like seven roads that lead to that town. So if you're going in that area of of Pennsylvania, you're gonna kind of have to go past Gettysburg, and they've got a rail station. You know what I mean? It's prominent roads, but it's kind of like on the way of like Carlisle, Harrisburg, you know, Chambersburg kind of area. But so it's not necessarily a prominent area like Harrisburg is. Mm -hmm. Um, So Yule is the lead element. So as as he goes north, Robert E. Lee's going to lead with General Ewell, and then he's going to move with A.P. Hill, and then bringing up the rear is going to be Longstreet. Uh, so you basically got like, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at them, um, you've got 2nd Corps, Jackson's old corps, who Ewell has. His new created 3rd Corps is A.P. Hill. That's who Robert E. Lee is going to move with. And then Longstreet, 1st Corps, his most competent corps commander is bringing, bringing up the, up the rear. rear. Interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of find that interesting as, as well, too. Because, uh, you know, we can compare, you know, in a little while of, of who George Gordon Meade's leading with. Because uh, he's not using his – you know, You'll find out later. He's, he doesn't have Dan Sickles up there leading the charge. It's Reynolds mm-hmm. uh, is the lead corps commander for the Army of the Potomac. And and as Yule's moving through, he's got to get resupplied and stuff along the way. You know what I mean? So he sends folks into Gettysburg, and they're just there to get shoes and supplies, like literally. They're not there to attack, do anything to civilian folks. They just, But there's a militia there, you know, the little town militia. Uh, you know what I mean? They're going to g- grab their muskets, and they're like, here comes the Confederates. They go out, they fire a couple of shots, and they run the hell away because they're not going to, you know, the, this militia is not going to stand up because all like the fighting folks from in and around Pennsylvania, they're in the Army yep. of the Potomac yep. or they're in the defensive. So they're nothing against militia people in, in Gettysburg. They're just, you're not going to go up against a professional army, especially not the Army of Northern Virginia, 7 0 1. So these guys are going to come in. And they're going to report out. You know what I mean? Like every day you got to send reports mm-hmm. to the boss. So Yule reports that, hey, man, we got supplies in Gettysburg. We kind of cruised in. We had a, you know, they had a small militia because that's going to play a, a part later on with another corps commander because that's information that everybody knows of like, hey, like if I cruise by, I'm going to send folks in. Maybe I'm going to go into Gettysburg. The only threat that's there is militia. Mm hmm. So that that's going to play into how we get into the Battle of Gettysburg a little bit. So that's kind of Robert E. Lee. So uh, as this is happening, what what's Meade? What's Meade's goal? So they must see this maneuver happening. What is Meade? What is the, what is the president? What's Lincoln going to tell Meade to do? Yeah. So it's the same thing. So one, uh, you know, hey, tag, you're it. You're the commander. Uh, and he's got to kind of figure out of like, okay, well, everybody knows Robert E. Lee is moving north. He's he's already in Pennsylvania, uh, and they know this. And and I'm sure that with you know, if you look at the folks that that are in the Army of the Potomac, you know, we talked about Meade, Pennsylvania, Reynolds, Pennsylvania, Hancock, Pennsylvania. I mean, they got a lot of dudes from Pennsylvania, and their families live in Pennsylvania. So I'm sure they're all like, yeah, dude. Now it's our home turf. Now we're playing tag in my neighborhood. Uh, you know what I mean? Like these people like me now. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm sure at first they're thinking, yep, we're going up there, man. We're going to get Robert E. Lee out. But he's got a boss. And Abraham Lincoln's biggest concern, so his, you know, his, uh, his strategy or in his vision that he's going to give to George Gordon Meade is protect Baltimore and Washington. That's the biggest commander's intent. And the, the number one mission for Meade is you protect Washington, D.C., and you protect Baltimore. Yep. And what's interesting about this, if you're, if you're listening, if you're not too familiar with the battles, that means from where, from where the Confederates are, they would be moving south to Baltimore and D.C. because they've come up into Pennsylvania and now they would be moving south towards DC. So so just so you have that in your head, because I know when I first started reading about this, I'd be like, oh, oh, they're they're not moving north. You know, you think, oh, the South is gonna move north to attack. They're already up north. They're north 
of DC. So now they would be pushing south. So what's what what does Meade come up with for a plan? Uh, you know his his thoughts are you know he, of course he's looking at the at the map reconnaissance uh, of the area. The, the good thing is is you know. Uh, you know, like uh, they're in Frederick, Maryland and that area. I mean, folks have been there, man. Like these guys, you know, these are established roads. They got people that are in the organization that kind of know, you know what I mean, the, the whereabouts. Uh, and then so he's got to pick a spot because he doesn't know. Again, like where's the Army of Northern Virginia going to go? Are they going to threaten Baltimore? Or are they going to threaten D.C.? Because he can't do both. You know what I mean? He's not going to send one corps to Baltimore and two corps to D.C. Like he, that's not how Robert E. Lee, you're always going to bring the army together. You're going to go after one. Uh, so there, there's a creek. It's called the Pipe Creek. So he comes up with this Pipe Creek plan. Uh, I think he actually names it like the Pipe Creek Circular uh, of, of his thoughts, processes of, of how he's going to defend Baltimore and Washington. Uh, And Pipe Creek is down there in that in that Maryland area on the Pennsylvania border. But it's so that he can anchor in. He's got good anchor. His left is going to be anchored in and his right anchored in. So it's kind of like a sack. And if Robert E. Lee turns to the south, making his way to threaten Baltimore or Washington, he's got enough maneuver space to block. So kind of like how we were talking about on the last podcast of where Robert E. Lee is moving and blocking to keep them out of Richmond. You know what I mean? Now he's doing the same thing. But the only difference with this is, which is kind of crazy, is, uh, dude, I mean, how do you think the governor of Pennsylvania is feeling right now? I feel like <laughs> New Jersey. Uh, you know what I mean? Like these dudes, and we've got, I mean, if anybody wants to, I mean, you can literally, like, you can see all the email traffic uh, of what we would call today because it's captured in time and recorded uh, you can go back and you can read some of these letters from governors sending to Abraham Lincoln like, hey, dude, we got nobody here to defend our home state because we sent them all for your war, brother. You know what I mean? You need to get these dudes the hell out of my fucking state. I mean, you know what I mean? Paraphrase, I'm sure they didn't drop an F-bomb. I would have. Uh, you know what I mean? Because if I was the governor of Pennsylvania, yeah, hey, dude, I sent you all my able bodies. I've got women and kids back here, man, and I got the Army of Northern Virginia, and we all read in the paper what your army did to Fredericksburg, dude. You don't think these guys are going to come back up? Yeah, you want to like you know blow our cities to hell and back and loot our stuff? We're in your turf now, you know what I mean? But luckily, you know Robert E. Lee's made it very clear. Dude, we're up here, hearts and minds, man. We're not looting. You're not looking to get a bunch of free stuff, dude. You know what I mean? We're up here. This is the purpose. So Lincoln's getting pressure. And, and I'm sure as an army commander, he's getting pressure. Like some of these politicians, man, they're just going to go VR direct. You know what I mean? Like, hey, dude, you need to send somebody up here and get these people out of here. And uh, and Meade, he's going to go with the boss. He's going to think of. He's going to come up with this Pipe Creek plan uh, and to be able to protect Baltimore and Washington. And he's hoping he can do a defensive operation, so he's not going to go offensive. And with that he's going to have Robert E. Lee hit him. Uh, and But he's also learning. He's not, you know, in this whole thing, we're not going to have any flanks in the air. What's his anchor points? He's got two stream beds. You know what I mean? So he's anchored in, kind of like how he was anchored in on the Rappahannock. Yep. So it's a, it's a, a vast, it's, I mean, it, it, it's good terrain. He's selecting, and he has that time, and he also has enough time where he can call audibles, and he's got good road systems to be able to move. So he can go laterally as well. Uh, Yeah, Meade, again, he's an engineer, and the dude is, like, wicked smart. So he puts some good thought into this. Uh, The only problem is is that, you know, he's got, you know, everybody is kind of pursuing up towards the Army of Northern Virginia, so – He's in Frederick, Maryland, but his first corps commander, because now he's in charge, his first corps commander is is Reynolds. And Reynolds is also like a, a wing commander. So Reynolds is got he's he's in charge of his corps. He's still a corps commander, but he's also got uh oh Howard with eleventh corps as part of his wing. So he's got Howard following in trace. So Howard is kind of following Reynolds. Which, and are they maneuvering towards Pipes Creek? No, is that where they're going? Nope they no, they they're not they're not privy yet to the pipes. Group. They're just moving, chasing. They got to keep an eye on where the hell is Robert E. Lee going, so got that it. they're prepared. 
uh, and and out in the lead of of Reynolds, the lead element of Reynolds is his cavalry. Yeah, yeah. he's got yeah, his reconnaissance. Yep, yeah, he's got a uh, he he's got a, a general uh, that's up there, and and he's running reconnaissance to basically to report the Reynolds of like he's got eyes on the Confederacy. He's the he's the dude that's reporting back. That's how they know like the progress of the Confederacy that he's doing his job. Uh, and the guy that uh, that works for Reynolds uh, is an interesting interesting fellow named John Buford. Uh, he's the cavalry commander and he's running reconnaissance for Reynolds. So we've talked a little bit about cavalry, but just just to clarify, cavalry their the main purpose of cavalry is look you're on a horse you can go fast. And you can go fast. You can find out what's going on. You can you can then report that information back up the chain of command. That's what the purpose of cavalry at this time is to go out, do recon, and 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 so that's what's happening. Um, and as so so we already had Ewell pushed up. He passed by Gettysburg. Sent some people in there for supplies, ran into a little militia, no factor, kept going. Now we got A.P. Hill. He's now passing Gettysburg. Um, And as he's passing Gettysburg, that reconnaissance element from the Union ran by Buford. He happens to be in Gettysburg. Yep. And he's looking out as A.P. Hill's passing by Gettysburg and sees him. Um sees you know them and by them i mean tens of thousands what do we got 40 50 thousand troops <laughs> troops walking well because the, the, yeah it's it's the macy's day parade and he's over in like uh on the chambersburg pike uh so looking over towards that cumberland that mountain range that as you're looking from gettysburg so yeah so he, from gettysburg as you look west yes it kind of it kind of sinks down the terrain sinks down and then it rises back up again just gently it's very pretty gentle gentle slope down and then it comes back up and in that sort of valley closer to where it comes back up that's where ap hill has got his core walking up yep uh, and it's the, you know the modern day that that Chambersburg Pike uh, and yeah and because of the the like the reorg so it's basically like he's got like fifteen thousand dudes uh, it's the Macy's Day Parade uh, you know what I mean it's a it's a two lane two track road uh, you know what I mean it's prominent like I said I mean Gettysburg Pennsylvania man been there you know before we were even a country. Uh, but it's those rolling farmland uh, of Pennsylvania that a lot of people are are very familiar with. So, A. P. Hill is is making his approach up, and it's amazing. You know, so is A. P. Hill hooking a right and now headed to Gettysburg? Yeah, he's he's his approach is coming towards Gettysburg. Yeah, you know I mean, I'm sure he needs resupplies and all that kind of stuff, and he's thinking the same thing. Yule did it. Yeah, you know I mean, it's just like if I'm if I'm ahead of you by a couple of days, and I'm like, yeah, hey Jocko, man, hey, don't stop at this gas station, man. They're out of this, and this gas station's got this. Make sure you go to a Wawa. They're out of Jocko. You know what I mean? <laughs> Fuel. You need to give them a call real quick. So you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that place. So uh, you're going to take the recommendations of the reconnaissance that's done before you. Mm-hmm. So he's like, okay, well, I can head into Gettysburg. I'm going to. So he's making an approach coming out of Chambersburg. And he's making the approach coming towards Gettysburg, but he's still like, you know, he's still like 10 miles out. You know what I mean? And, but Buford gets eyes on him. I mean, you're moving that amount of people, man, in June. That's a lot of dust. There's a lot of animals. You know what I mean? That's just, you, you, it, that's like trying to hide the Macy's Day Parade in the freaking desert, man. You're going to see him from a long ways away. And he's got good eyes on him. And that's his job. So Buford sees this, you know, the Army of Northern Virginia. He doesn't necessarily know at the time, like, which core, but he knows that, like, there's folks up threatening up around in Harrisburg, Carlisle area that's just north of that Chambersburg and north of Gettysburg. So he knows he's got a body that's up there, uh, and then he's got one that's right here, Chambersburg, and then he he doesn't know where Longstreet is. Mm -hmm. Nobody's got eyes on Longstreet. So... Uh, he, he, yeah, so you got a uh, Buford, he sees this, uh, and he's got to make decisions of what he does. But like you had said, he's cavalry and the job of cavalry is reconnaissance. And if you're in reconnaissance, you literally are told that, you know what I mean? You can't do reconnaissance if you're dead. 
So don't go get in a gunfight, man. You know what I mean? Just get the reconnaissance, come back and tell us. Unless you get in a little skirmish, chance contact. Yeah, okay, take a couple of shots, swing your sword a few times, shoot a shotgun, but get the hell out of there. Because you can't do recon if you're dead. Mm -hmm. So that's his job, is to go back and report the Reynolds. And and at the same time, he's thinking, there's some terrain that I'm sitting on right now that if they get, going to be a problem. So at the same time, he's thinking, hey, I know my job is to run back and, and tell my boss what's going on. At the same time, he's thinking, wait a second. If we just let these, if we let this this army roll, these Confederates roll in here, they're going to be in a really good spot, and it's going to be a big problem for us. So he's got a little bit of a decision to make. Yeah, because his boss Reynolds is about ten miles east of Gettysburg, coming his way. So you got these two folks, and he's sitting on McPherson's Ridge. So, and, and as we know, like Buford made his way through Gettysburg and he's doing reconnaissance, he's doing map, map updates, he's looking at terrain, defensible positions. I mean, dude, Buford is a competent cavalry commander, man. The guy's like been there, done that, t shirts and hats, man. He is, love the guy, as you can kind of tell. Uh, so as he's coming through town, yeah, it's just like you said, he's, he's up on McPherson's Ridge and he's like, if those guys get. So in Gettysburg, you got three ridge lines, mm-hmm. right? You've got McPherson's Ridge, which is the closest to you know AP Hills Corps. Then you've got the Seminary and, and Mc, Ridge. McPherson's Ridge is sort of just what would you say northwest of the town of Gettysburg? Yes. So just if you're trying to picture this in your mind, you got three ridges we're about to talk about. The first one, McPherson's Ridge, is the furthest northwest. It's Northwest of the little town of Gettysburg. That's the first ridge that we're talking about. Yep. Second ridge. Second ridge. Seminary Ridge. Because it has the first Lutheran seminary ever established in the United States. It's a prominent building. Still there. Uh, If you've seen the movie, you'll see the cupola, all that kind of stuff. Uh, The steeple, basically. Uh, So you got the Seminary Ridge. And they're in between the McPherson's Ridge and the Seminary Ridge is that low kind of farm field that still is there. You know what I mean? So it's got like barley or corn and, you know what I mean, that kind of stuff growing. So it's flat valley. And then it's, you know, and we've been there multiple yep. times. You know what I mean? It's not really a big rise up onto the Seminary, but it's enough to where, like, that's a, you got a primary line and you got a secondary line that can support the same mission. Yeah. So yeah, it's so seminary ridge. And then eventually you're gonna go, you know, lose a little bit of altitude again. You're gonna get to the town of Gettysburg, and then it's gonna go up on the final ridge, which is Cemetery Ridge. Cemetery, and it's pretty easy to find because there's like a lot of these white stones up there, and it's a freaking cemetery. Right. And cemetery, uh, and and it's even. Like a lot of folks, when you go there, you're like, where the hell's the ridge? I mean, but the ridge is just like that. I mean, it's just enough of a rise because, again, between the seminary and the cemetery, it's another drop down. And you do have the town, but south of the town, it's all farm. Open. Yep. Open. Open. I mean, and that, so, and then it's got that slight little rise. And what would you say, Jocko? It's like maybe like three quarters of a mile in mm-hmm. between cemetery and seminary ridge. Yep. And then it's probably less than that. Mm-hmm. McPherson to seminary is like, what, maybe a half a mile? Yep. I mean, it, you're within range. I mean, yep. that's, that's 308. Yep. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, so you're looking at those three series with a little bitty town. I mean, Gettysburg's not a banging town. No, no. Even right now, it's like a little tiny town. Yeah. And at the top, at the north end of Cemetery, you've got some other terrain features as well. Yep. You got, uh, uh, you got uh, uh, what's called Culp's Hill. So you got Cemetery Hill where the cemetery is. And then what is that, like a, a little bit like west like just west of it, like I mean, not very far at all, man. Like not uh, less than a mile. Mm-hmm. You've got Culp's Hill, which is a wood lot uh, for the Culp Farm that's over there on that side. Uh, then you've got Wolf Hill, uh, that's a farther to the east and and a little bit north. And then you got Benner Hill. You know what I mean? It's another little prominent terrain feature. But those ones that are there aren't as like 
Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill next to the town, like those are the prominent yeah. features. And then if you run south down the Cemetery Ridge, it's going to drop down low. And the next thing you know, it's going to kick up and you're going to gain some elevation and you're going to get like back in 63, they just called it the round top. Mm-hmm. In 2022, you've got the first little spur is little round top, and then you got a little draw, and then it kicks up to big round top. And that's all a part of Cemetery Ridge. So if that kind of, I mean, I feel like I'm literally there right now, yeah. Uh, you know, which, yeah, love it. Uh, so that's where Buford's at. Buford's at that, that first Ridge, McPherson's Ridge, he's there. He's looking. He sees AP Hill, uh, 15,000 strong that he can kind of, you know, the dust, the, the animals, like he sees what's going on. He's got a decision to make. What should I do? And I'm going to go to this book uh, by John Buford. Uh, the book is called John Buford, a military biography written by a guy by the name of Edward Longacre. And so here's what he says about this decision. By early evening, armed with reliable reports of enemy movements in the vicinity, Buford appears to have convinced himself that he could pull off something never achieved in this war, a defense in depth by dismounted cavalry against a large force of foot soldiers with full artillery support. Of course, it would be a risky proposition. His scouts had informed Buford that not only would he face a good portion of Lee's army outside of Chambersburg and Cashtown, he would also have to contend with veteran infantry along roads from Carlisle and York. To oppose these several columns, Buford could place perhaps 2,200 troopers on the firing line after subtracting his, from his aggregate force the one man in four who would serve as a horse holder. Tell me about the job of a horse holder. What's going on with that? Yeah, so uh, with the, the horse holder kind of thing is, is if, you, if we're at a, uh, at a four-man team, right, so he, they're going to dismount and they're going to fight like dragoons, like infantry guys. So these guys are going to like rock, paper, scissor from the four of them, and whoever <laughs> wins, they're going to take all the horses because that's our escape route. Like, the horses are very important to the cavalry, and they're going to take the horses, and they're going to go all the way back over behind Seminary Ridge, and they're going to hold all four horses. So after I'm, like, picked to hold the horses, you know, Jocko would be looking at me like, J.D., dude, don't don't you fucking leave with my horse, man. (laughs) I don't care how bad it gets, dude. You better be there. Because, I mean, it's going to be game on. Yeah. I mean, what he does here – is incredible yeah. as a cavalry commander. But the point, one of the major points there is that we just gave up a quarter of our fighting yeah. force. A quarter of our guys just left with the horses, t- taking care of our extraction platform, which is v- we're very thankful for. But that means JD's back there. You know, he's back there over <laughs> one one terrain feature away, you know, chilling out with some horses. We lost that much of firepower. So here we go back to the book against such odds, Buford could expect to hold his ground for a few hours at best. But would he have that much time? Although he was in contact with Reynolds and knew the wing commander would march for Gettysburg come morning, Buford could not say when the nearest elements of the army would reach him. By refusing to flee from Lee's path, by committing himself to fight in an advanced position, however favorable, he risked not only his division's annihilation, but the disarranging of General Meade's plans, which were predicated on a defensive struggle among the rolling hills of Northern Maryland. Each of these considerations and others that came to Buford's mind carried its own argument against doing what he desired to do. Taking a long puff off his pipe, he considered each argument in turn, scrutinizing it from a variety of angles. Then he went back over his plan and matched each of, the, of its assumptions with an appropriate set of consequences. For a time, he permitted the mixture of pros and cons to simmer. In the end, the strength of the defensive position he had selected for his army, as well as an irresistible enthusiasm for calculated risk, overpowered whatever misgivings he might have entertained. 
Before sundown on the last day in June, Buford had committed himself in thought and in deed to the greatest challenge of his career. That challenge being trying to hold off 15,000, trying to, trying to hold off the, the Army of Northern Virginia with 2,000 guys. Yeah, and I mean, and you made a, a great point earlier, Jocko, when you were talking about like a, a four. So, okay, so he's got 2,000. So how many, you take a quarter of that, that's not 2,000 anymore. You got 500 dudes holding horses. I mean, that, uh, and for cavalry, man, to just go up against infantry, because infantry's bringing artillery with them. You know what I mean? Like, that. it's just, uh, this, this is something that you don't necessarily see every day. But, you know, Buford has a vision. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, as he rides along. And, and the other thing that's cool about Buford is, Buford is 37 years old at this time, man. I mean, 37, he's young. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, looking at it of those, of course, now I think he's young. Back when I was a lot younger, I thought he was an old man too. But uh, I look now at 37, like, that dude's a young punk. Uh, you know, so he has a vision because he, he knows, because uh, he's so in tune with situational awareness of what's going on in the Army of the Potomac that all the corps spread out. And he knows with the new commander Meade is slow and methodical. He's an engineer. And if, if A.P. Hill and Robert E. Lee can get his corps together and gain these high grounds of Gettysburg, then he's going to roll up 1st Corps. Then he's going to roll up 11th Corps. You know what I mean? He's going to piecemeal these guys because he understands how fast the OODA loop of Robert E. Lee moves. So it's just incredible that Buford – can see this of what's going to happen to his army, and he's got to make he's got to make a call, and he's got to make a stand. He's got to slow this machine down and buy time for his commanders. Yeah, and really that point of knowing that he look he doesn't have to necessarily stop them. What he's going to intentionally do is slow them down, and they go like into a into like a Russian defense, right? Like, hey, we're gonna get out there, we're gonna scrap with you a little bit, you start doing well, you start kicking my ass a little bit, cool, I'm gonna pull back. I'm gonna pull back to this next little micro-terrain feature. I'm gonna pull over this little over this little knoll, into this little ravine, oh, behind this, this stone wall, and they're just gonna harass and slow down and just retreat bit by bit, but make these guys, I mean, dude, you're moving, we're moving 15, 20,000 people. Like, cool, you're walking, down, you know, you here's me and JD, we're walking down the road, all of a sudden, crack, crack, we're getting shot at. We're running over, we're laying down, somebody's yelling orders to us, we're reloading, we took our backpacks off, we're we're fighting, we're waiting, you know, okay, can we get up and move now? You get up, and, oh, no, we got shot at again, no, another 15 minutes, I'm not moving, J, you moving, I'm not moving, okay. So you can see where this is going. Like that's what exactly what they do is is uh, Buford's guys. They push out, and it's great when you're on Gettysburg. When you're at Gettysburg, when you're, when you're on McPherson's Ridge, you can see they kind of push down down off of McPherson's Ridge a little bit to start to intercept them early, and that's exactly what they do. And so now they are able to uh, fight as dragoons, which is awesome <laughs> and and slow them down now part of this is Buford and Reynolds too like they have an outstanding relationship um, and Buford sends a note to Reynolds like hey boss here's what's going on I got 10 or 20 thousand people heading my way I'm doing my best to slow down get up here please yeah exactly uh you know, and it, because it's it's not like the cavalry guys are like gonna dig in, you know what I mean, and go like, oh yeah, we're gonna hold these folks off. It's exactly what you were talking. about. I mean, you know, like earlier we kind of talked about like, you know, if we went home and said, hey, you know, we tell the wife and kids, let's go get in the car. You know what I mean? We're gonna go out to dinner, and it's gonna take like fifteen minutes. Easy. <laughs> well, if you put like one person outside shooting at us, it's gonna take a hell of a lot longer than fifteen minutes because you're gonna be trying to get the kids. Hey, go out and go ahead and start the car. Like I'm not going the hell out there, man. There's somebody out there shooting at me. You know what I mean? And 
So that ability again, and I, so he's he's looking at it, you know that that time distance space, and and his relationship that he has with Reynolds. I mean, we've already talked about John Reynolds, man. I mean, obviously he's very well thought of. If Abraham Lincoln it wants him to run the army, uh, if two, you know what I mean. A lot of the folks, like the troops, love Reynolds. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, he's just a, he's a great guy, great commander, and then he's got a great relationship with his reconnaissance officer that's that's John Buford. So these guys have a great that's his eyes and ears. Like, you know, everything he's a a, a directed telescope of the commander. So Reynolds trusts Buford. And like I said, and Buford's got a I mean, in that book uh written on John Buford, uh, you know, I mean, Buford's got time where he learned this kind of stuff because he was out west. Remember, like on on future episodes, we talked about how big the army was at the beginning of the Civil War, and all those companies were all out west. Well, he was one of those guys out west, and he was fighting against the Native Americans, and they learned really quickly. Cavalry and shooting a rifle off of a horse doesn't really work out that well. Get the hell off the horse, man. You know what I mean? And 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 fight like dragoons. So he's going to bring that kind of tactic to, to Gettysburg. Uh, and then his just, I mean, he's a student of the game. To him to be a cavalry guy and to understand that defense in depth the time, distance, space. You know what I mean? That is what's just amazing to me with John Buford. Uh, and then he's going to send that note back. And he also knows because, you know, it's a big risk for him. Like, he doesn't know what Reynolds is going to do. And he also doesn't know what kind of the rest of the Army's doing. Like, Buford doesn't know that this Pipe Creek kind of thing's coming out. But Reynolds and the Corps commanders are getting word of this. You know what I mean? That, hey, man, this is kind of kind of be – I mean, they, they, they have to expect, like, you get a new commander, he's going to come out with orders. Uh, and with that, as soon as Reynolds gets that note, you know what I mean, he giddy-ups and starts making his way towards Gettysburg. And, again, he's got a, about a 10-miler. You know what I mean? Well, again, 10 miles, man, and it, it, he's got pretty good roads – but he's going to make his way because he understands that he's got 2,000 folks and he's reporting that there's 15,000 people heading that way. Reynolds is a smart guy, man. He can do the math quickly. And he's like, if you get here and you can hold this high ground, man, you're going to lay the wood to those Confederates coming up this road. So Reynolds is going to giddy up and he's going to get his way He's not stopping at Starbucks to get a frappa lap a ding dong, man. He's getting on the pony and he's riding. Yeah, much different than, you know, we, we spoke a lot about McClellan and how McClellan would exaggerate what was happening. There's this many troops. And so, like, you get a report from McClellan, like, hey, I need help. I got, you know, 20,000. You're like, oh, whatever, dude. He's <laughs> like, I'm blowing this guy off. But when you have that trust, you have that relationship, then it's, oh, if Buford's telling me that I need to get up there, Let's go. Let's go. So that trust up and down the chain of command and that relationship up and down the chain of command is uh, is what allows this to be successful, at least in this early stage of the battle. Yeah, because and even it even goes farther with that. Now you're looking at I mean, it's a whole different dynamic that we're dealing with here in the Army of the Potomac. Like when you brought up like little Mac and like, you know, his I mean, if that was him at McPherson's Ridge, there's one hundred ninety eight million people down to Chambersburg. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like like the whole Confederacy has moved to Chambersburg, Uh, you know, with with these guys. So he's going to get that information from Buford. So guess what Reynolds is going to do? He's going to send a freaking teenager man down, and he's going to let the other folks know. He's going to let his boss know because of his relationship with Meade. And anything coming from Reynolds to Meade, you think he's going to be like, oh, man, what the hell is Reynolds doing up there, man? I got this whole plan I've been working on. I mean, you know, typical engineer. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, you know, my dad, you know, he's got nothing against engineers. I love them. Uh, but, you know, he's like, man, I, I'm sure he put a lot of thought into that freaking plan. Into Pipes Creek. Yeah, and into now Pipes P- Creek. And now Pipes Creek, he's getting that's kind of getting thrown out the window. Yeah, because now you've also got these other core commanders that are down in Maryland. So if you're going to shift from, from down at Pipes Creek up to Gettysburg, you're causing a lot of your peer core commanders 
they're going to have to make a pretty significant move. 40-something miles. Right. So instead of Reynolds going, you know, let's say 30, 30 40 miles to get down there, now if, if they establish this is going to be where go time is, now all of those folks, to include the new Army commander, has got to come from Frederick, Maryland, to Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. So he's literally putting the entire Army in motion. And all the other, his peers have already seen the Pipe Creek Circular. So what do you think they're all doing? <laughs> Getting their folks ready to go to Pipe Creek. And then here's John Reynolds sends a note back. And this guy, Buford, who's a cavalry guy, is making this call. Uh, you know, it's just amazing the relationship between Buford to Reynolds to Meade. I mean, we're seeing something that we haven't seen in the Army of the Potomac. You also see open minds, you know, which we've seen a lot of closed minds. I haven't really used that term. I use it all the time in, in, when I work with people and talk about leadership. We, we've seen a lot of closed minds, i.e. we're at Chancellorville. I get a report that the Confederates are moving to my flank, and I go, I, I, I don't want to hear that. Right? <laughs> There's a lot of these closed minds, but to have an open mind and think, oh, the battle is not what I thought it was going to be. My mind is open. What adjustments do we need to make? Now, we've also talked about the fact that Lee likes to pick his battlefield. Oh, he, yeah. he likes to choose where he's going to fight. And it seems like this is not his, at this point, this is not, he's not looking at this as an advantageous place to get into a scrap with his whole, with his whole army. So if this is a point where he's saying, look, you're going to go into Gettysburg, okay, there might be some militia in there, okay, but we don't want to fight here. We, you know, and his orders are don't get into a general engagement. Right? That's, that's, that's Lee's assessment. Yep. That's what Lee, he doesn't want to get into a big fight here. He's, he, he hadn't chosen this. He, you know, maybe he hasn't gone up there and looked at it himself or he's got some other thing in mind or he's seeing the vision of where he wants this battle to take place and it ain't in Gettysburg. So he tells his guys, all right, hey, you're going to go in, get some stuff. Don't, don't get, you might get some resistance, okay, but don't get into a general engagement. How's that work out for him? Yeah, uh, and, and your spot. Remember, you know these three corps are all separated. So he's, you know, and and if he's going to go into about he's every battle that we've talked about. There's one thing that's for certain: the Union always has more people than the Confederates. Like er, every one that we've we've never talked about. Like man, Robert E. Lee's got him like three to one. Like he's never seen those odds. So yeah, and he likes to see the truck. Robert E. Lee is a, he's an engineer as well. His he's just got a really cool oodle loop. You know what I mean? Like the dude can I mean he can figure shit out quick. Uh, that, that's why a lot of the folks you know when you when you study Robert E. Lee and and there's you know tons of stuff written written on Robert E. Lee as well. So uh, you know he's got a bunch of teenage couriers that are hanging out with him as well. So he's you know when they get up in the morning you know of July first. You know what I mean? He's got to send a yellow sticky out to his core commanders, just like he had been doing forever. And and you were spot on, man. You know he's going to send a note out that says, "Do not get at a general engagement." Primary reason being, well, primary reason being is like, hey, look, Ewell's up north. Yep. Uh, Longstreet's still down south. Like we're we're not we're not unified, yep. and we don't want to get a fight. Like, hey, I walk into a bar by myself. I'm going to wait till Echo and JD show up before I start hitting people, right? That's <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get into a general engagement. Like I might talk a little smack, but I'm going to like keep it cool. So that's what he's saying. He's like, look, we're not unified right now. Don't get in. And, and I haven't seen the terrain. I don't know about the terrain. This, I haven't decided this is where I want to fight. So he tells everybody on his little yellow stick, he's courier send out, don't get in a general engagement. Yeah. And, and you can only imagine that, that also with, with Robert E. Lee, you know, he he had his two core, and he had his his defensive mindset of of James Longstreet, and he had his offensive mindset of Stonewall Jackson. Well, that's gone. So he's also got two new core commanders. So I could imagine he he want he wants to yeah he wants to keep them in close, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna imagine on an away game. 
I think offensive is not something that he's – like he wants to get into a position to where he can be attacked because he's always outnumbered. His resupply – I mean, his resupply, man, running all the way back down to the valley, I mean, it's like – I mean, he's got – it's like 20 miles, man, of a log train. I mean, huge log- – because he's got to bring all his stuff with him. Uh, if you look at the Army of the Potomac of Frederick, Maryland, and all that, their supplies – you know, they got Baltimore and Washington literally to their southeast with road networks <laughs> – so, like, their resupply depot is as, as good as it's going to get. As good as period. it's going to, yeah. And and also, the road network comes right up in and behind Cemetery and Culp's Hill. Mm. So, I mean, that, that's good terrain. It's like ideal. Ideal. And, and, yeah, of course, yeah, Pipes Creek would have been banging too. Uh, but that's kind of – they're still accomplishing the mission of the boss, they're just in a different location mm-hmm. protecting Baltimore and Washington. And the trust that he has with those commanders to select that position for him is something that's different in the Army of Northern Virginia. You, you see what I'm kind of you know, I'm getting at? It's like Robert E. Lee wants to pick. That, that 7-0-1, that one is because Robert E. Lee didn't get a chance to pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was forced upon him. So he's going to – He's going to send that that yellow sticky out to all the core commanders that don't get a general engagement. And again, Robert E. Lee is moving on the Chambersburg Pike with A.P. Hill. And they're making the approach to Gettysburg. And they don't know that, you know, that that's John Buford up there. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, they don't know that because everybody's always going to like, we might as well just go ahead and throw this out here on the table right now, man. Everybody's like, oh, well, they didn't have cavalry. No, they just didn't have Jeb Stewart. There's there's freaking cavalry with the Army of Northern Virginia. It's just not Jeb Stewart. So when people are like, oh, he didn't have cavalry. No, he had cavalry. He didn't have Jeb Stewart. So they could still could have done a better job with reconnaissance? Yeah. They could have been running reconnaissance just like – but, you know, and, and that could be a downfall of Robert E. Lee. I mean, he really likes, you know, Jeb Stewart. But Jeb Stewart, man, is – he, you know, he's he's off doing like Jeb Stewart shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> which is what he's out riding around uh, yeah. further south. Yeah, he's south and coming up on the other side. I mean, he's notorious for you know doing his ride around the entire army. You know, di- I mean, d- kind of doing his disrupting logistical trains. You know, ripping up rail line, tearing up bridges. Cutting uh, telegraph. I mean, doing all that stuff that's just like that. that. Just running around being an asshole. Dude, he's an <laughs> asshole, man. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, and, and everybody just hates it. You know what I mean? They're like, that son of a bitch. Because it's just like anything else. You don't even have to fire a shot. You cut the line, and they're all using telegraph. <laughs> Sir, no, we're not getting a response back. That son of a bitch cut the fucking line again. <laughs> and that's going to take time. Yeah. And that's the the most perishable is time. That's the only thing you can't get back, man, is yeah. time. So so as this has happened, so there's not real great reconnaissance. And you got, you know, uh, it's actually, what is it, Heath at the front of, yep. of the push into Gettysburg. Heath is at the front of the Army of Northern Virginia, front of the Confederates. Heath is out front. And, you know, you, you, you always, when we're up there, you always do a pretty good... Uh, <laughs> you always do a pretty good reenactment of, you know, you know, generally and maybe it's AP Hill and they're kind of riding on their horses heading to Gettysburg and like they hear some gunfire, you know, like bang, bang. And they're like, oh, and generally he kind of looks over like, what's that? Well, you know, probably just, you know, some of those militias they were coming up against. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah, militia. And then they hear bang, 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 bang. And they hear, what was that? Maybe, maybe a little more militia resistance. And then they start hearing cannons, and then they start hearing a lot of a lot of <laughs> rifles and muskets fired, and all of a sudden, starts sounding a hell of a lot like a general engagement. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> when we're up there, you know, you talk about like up on Oak Hill, uh, if you're ever up there, because I always, I mean, you're talking about Robert E. Lee here, man. I mean, now that Jackson's down, like he is the Confederacy, and you know. And, and he's riding with A.P. Hill. And this is A.P. Heath works for A.P. Hill moving uh, with the Third Corps. 
uh and you know and he's probably just like is it's just like me you know if i was if i'm lee and you're apl and i'm looking over you and i'm like well, jocko you got the sticky right <laughs> you know, yep yes sir i got the sticky don't get in the general engagement. did you pass that on to your subordinate folks well of course i did sir <laughs> those are like that's artillery up there brother <laughs> you know what i mean but again to go back to your point of not running reconnaissance the last reconnaissance information that they had in gettysburg was it was militia you know what i mean so failing to run you know what i mean you're a core commander man come on ap you know what I mean? Lead, throw some guys out, man. Get some eyes on before you're going to just get on the road and start hey diddle diddling your way up there, man. But he's got Heath, and he's making his way up. And just like you said, like, I mean, Buford's playing it smart. He's got those guys down there in that valley. Like, when we stand up there, man, by the barn, like, mm-hmm. you can't get a better view, man. And then the other thing is, is you're standing in the exact spot of John Buford. I would go to Gettysburg just on that, just to do that. I just want to stand in the same spot as that dude. Uh, and, and if you want, like, wonder why I got, like, a man crush on him and stuff like that. If you get a chance to watch the movie uh, of Gettysburg, uh, Sam Elliott plays John Buford. And it's in my opinion, if you die and Sam Elliott plays you in the movie, <laughs> you were a badass. You're good to go. <laughs> oh, you're good to hook, brother. Uh, you know what I mean? So. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, like his balls need to be carried around in a dump truck for what he's doing up there on McPherson's Ridge. Just my, that's just shady. Uh, love the guy. So here comes Heath, and he's approaching, just like you said, but down there in that swamp, that creek that's down there in the bottom. And you can kind of see there's houses there now, but that was, you know what I mean? So yeah, now they're going to start taking those shots. And, and Heath and the commanders are like, yeah, they're not up front. And they got the privates, you know what I mean? And these dudes are getting shot at. So, of course, yeah, they're going to get down and they're going to deploy out. And they're going to start shooting back. And then they're going to be like, hey, man, we got some resistance up here. And I could just imagine the commander's going, yeah, hey, dude, it's a militia, man. Get up. We'll just push on. And then they they start pushing, and you know, that incline Mm -hmm. uh, coming up uh, to McPherson's Ridge. Uh, it's, It's pretty prominent. So now you're going uphill. And then when you hit that farmland like dude there's nowhere to hide out there and you got these dudes that are up there on that ridge and they're gonna start fire. and he's got you know cow he's got uh the uh, uh horse artillery with him so they got artillery up there you know what i mean not as much as an infantry but he's got he's got some guns so now you're getting hit with artillery and of course now if you have artillery you got counter artillery so he's going to bring up artillery they're going to start deploying and and hill and and lee are riding up you know they're like five miles back dude you can hear that shit you know what i mean and i can only imagine like dude that is a straight up engagement going on up there <laughs> and by the time uh you know when we go up there on oak hill and and, and it's a great vantage point to oversee uh gettysburg the town mm-hmm. Uh, And you can see the cemetery hill from over there because you're elevated enough above the town to see it. Uh, You could see Culp's Hill from there. You can see the Wolf Hills a little bit off into the distance. And Uh, this is where Lee ends up. This is where Lee ends up. So so Lee ends ends up in a place uh, that is that is north of Gettysburg town and and it's called Oak Hill. And like you're describing right now, it's a very good vantage point to to look at everything. And that's what he's now he's looking and going, well, yeah, this is a full on general engagement. We got a battle, but basically a battle going down here. (laughs) I mean, it's uh, but just to kind of put people in into like the perspective of what's happening is uh, like by the time Robert E. Lee gets there, because everybody's like, I mean, it's not like he's got a helicopter that can fly him up there. and He could do a quick buzz over. I mean, by the time he gets there, like. The the Confederates they've already gotten a general officer and and you like captured like you know what I mean like yeah the, the they're McPherson's Ridge they've already pushed back and now they're in that 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 valley that you and I talked about in between Seminary Ridge and McPherson's Ridge and you know you'll agree because we we've been up there a bunch of times when you look down off of oak hill that's a prominent drop Mm -hmm. and then it's just straight flat into the town where now like i mean it's flat enough to to put it into perspective like gettysburg college that's their sports fields 
You know what I mean? Yeah. So you don't play sports fields on a freaking hill, man. It's flat. It's a valley. So the, the, he he gets up there, and AP Hill and his folks they're successfully pushing that first core of John Reynolds back off of McPherson's Ridge by the time Robert E. Lee gets to Oak Hill. How's Reynolds doing? Unfortunately, uh, also by the time Robert E. Lee gets down there, John Reynolds is not the senior commander on the field anymore. Uh, He is like – Literally, uh, I mean, from from where we stand there at the McPherson barn uh, on McPherson's Ridge, like, I mean, what would you say, man? Like 200 yards down in that wood line, mm-hmm. a little bit back off of McPherson's Ridge is, you know, Reynolds gets shot and killed. Like uh, like out of the gate. For like him. out of the gate, yep. man. Uh, you know, and, and I, I always, I always kind of, you know, because obviously I, I've, Spent a lot of time standing up there just thinking about uh, John Buford and what he did that day. But I could imagine when he's up there just like laying the wood, you got 1,500 guys, and then you look back to the east and you got the seminary and you see Reynolds making his way up. Your man. bro. Oh, yeah. I bet he's like, son of a bitch, he's here, man. Because now, guess what? It's his rodeo. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, he's now the senior commander. And Reynolds is that guy. You know, he owns it. I mean, you want to talk about a guy that's got extreme ownership? One, those two. Mm-hmm. They own it. Reynolds isn't coming in and like, dude, I can't believe you picked this spot. He's just in it, and he is in the front lines. I mean, he's on me. He's not sitting back. He very well could have stayed back at the Seminary Ridge right next to the Seminary and sent folks forward and observed the battle from there. But you know as well as I, if you're on Seminary, you can't see down over on that with, on the uh, on the western slope mm-hmm. of McPherson's Ridge, so he comes all the way up to McPherson's Ridge, and there's a flipping gunfight. It's a battle going on, and he takes one and goes straight down. Uh, and and Reynolds is killed on McPherson's Ridge. There's a marker that's there. Uh, it sits tucked in uh, over by the wood line a little bit. You know, it, but you know you can see a path going to it because a lot of people uh, there's a. There's a, a, a Reynolds monument that's up there on the Chambersburg Pike of him on his horse that, that sits there as well. That's not where he got killed. That's just where his monument is. So you got to go over to the south, and, and you can see where the marker is of where he actually got killed. And as soon as he goes down, man, they get him off the field quickly because they don't want the troops to see that Reynolds is down because mm-hmm. that's a morale booster. General Reynolds goes down, man. Who now became the the senior guy on the on the field? Howard. That's uh that's not a morale booster. <laughs> <laughs> hey, while this is happening, we also have to remember that Yule is was further up north and now he's heading south. He got word, hey, this is what's going on. Get down here. So so you got Lee gets to Oak Hill, you got Ewell heading south to, and again, I always, just, just, to, just to remind everybody, the Confederate forces are moving to the south to engage because they had swept up to the north. That's why they're moving south, even though it might be counterintuitive. But, but Ewell is heading south to, to get in the engagement um, as well. Uh, and you got Lee up on, up on Oak Hill, and he's looking at the battlefield, and you know we got these 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 ridges that we're talking about, this high ground, this available high ground, and he's starting to think the same thing. Like, all right, well, I'm here. You think at this point he's decided this is where it's going to be? Yeah, uh, you know what I mean. Again, you know Robert E. Lee, man, he's a smart guy, and and just so folks know, like when we were talking earlier of, of when he gets to Oak Hill, and I encourage everybody go to Oak Hill. Uh, you, know, you can look across and you can see the cemetery and, and Culp's Hill, but you can also look up to the north at Carlisle. I mean, because it's, it's, it's flat farmland. There is no major terrain feature. So, yeah, so you got Yule making that approach. Like everybody, just like you said, they're all turning towards Gettysburg. 
uh, because it's not like they're up there just traipsing around. Remember what Robert E. Lee's trying to do. He's trying to sway the votes, man. It doesn't really even matter if he gets into a battle. Uh, you know what I mean? If, if he can politically put enough pressure on folks up there, you know what I mean, and, and threaten D.C., you know what I mean? He could force the hand uh, of the union uh, without even a battle. So now he's got these folks moving in. And when you're up there at Oak Hill, so he sees the approach of how Yule is going to come in and he's going to hit Gettysburg from the north. So you got A.P. Hill coming from west to east, and now you've got this other core of second core coming from north to south. That's pretty good geometry, and you're pushing. They have pushed them off McPherson's Ridge. They're pushing them back through to Seminary Ridge. Some of them are starting to make their way through the town of Gettysburg. And they're starting to, that third line is the Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge. Nobody's going to Culp's Hill because that's behind it. They're just going to the next high ground. They're not going to hang out in the town. They're just running through the town and they're ending up on Cemetery Hill, which is where Howard is hanging out. Mm -hmm. And they're watching this unfold. So when Robert E. Lee sees that geometry, he's going to call an audible. You know what I mean? It's kind of like the quarterback. He gets to kind of play from the coach, but then he walks out there and he gets a look. He's like, huh, I don't like the way the linebackers are looking here, man. And he's going to call Omaha. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? And, and they're going to call an audible. And and he's a smart enough guy. His OODA loop's kind of running. He's looking at the math. Yep, push him here. That's going to expose the right flank of the Union Army. And he knows that it's not the entire Army of the Potomac. Like, he knows, I mean, George Gordon Meade at this time is still literally in Frederick, Maryland, man. And he's got a couple of corps down there with them. So, man, this is a huge advantage for Robert E. Lee. It's almost the vision that Buford had. And he's going to do it without Longstreet. So he's going to send a yellow sticky down to Yule that tells Yule, Sees the heights beyond the town, if practicable. <laughs> Key word in this podcast has been practicable. So recap, you got Yule heading south. You got Lee up on Oak Hill. He's looking down. He measures the geometry, runs the calculus. He's like, I got this. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take that high ground that I can see, that, that General Lee can see. You can see that high ground back beyond the, beyond the, beyond the town. So he sends that message to Yule. Take, sees the heights beyond, beyond the town, if practicable. Now, what's really cool when you go there on the ground, we get to do this. You and I have done this many, many times now. We stand on Oak Hill. We look and we look at what's what heights are beyond the town. Then we get in our cars and we drive down to where Yule is approaching. Over by Barlow's. Over by yep. Barlow's. And it's a totally different picture. Totally. Totally different picture. So, you know, when you look at, you ever seen those weird pieces of art? If you're listening to this right now, you ever seen a weird piece of art where they, they, they take a bunch of like marbles hanging from the ceiling and you look at them, it just looks like a big blob and then you walk over to the right, and all of a sudden it looks like a horse, right? It's perspective. Yep. Perspective has changed. So that's exactly what happens here, where when Lee's looking up, he can basically see from that perspective on Oak Hill, it looks like there's some kind of a ridge beyond the town. That's what it looks like, just a, a general ridge, just some high ground. You go over to where Yule's looking at it from, what does it look like from there? It's, you're looking down a valley, dude. <laughs> there is no high ground beyond the town and you know when you look at a town you're you're kind of looking at the steeple uh, you know what i mean because it's still there to this day i mean like we said i mean it's not like gettysburg's a big town and you get over there like on the barlow's knoll and you're getting that perspective looking down and you're like dude i'm looking down a valley and it's not like uh he doesn't know where robert e lee is sending the message from yeah you know what I mean? which is another thing he's like hey dude I'm here, and this is how I'm looking. Just a cardinal direction. I'm looking from west to east at the town. Yule is a smart enough dude that he could be like, okay, he's looking at, so there's the town. Bobby's looking at, he can't call him Bobby yet. They're not that tight. 
so he's looking at it from from west to east. I'm looking at it from north to south. So if I put a map just literally on the ground and just like draw, do a quick freaking terrain model, like rub the dirt a little bit, you can draw the arrow. Okay, Lee must be here. Here's the town. This is it. There's the heights. Got it. Mm -hmm. Because his perspective, he's going to be like, okay, he must be somewhere over there because he knows he's moving with AP Hill. Right. But AP Hill, dude, is like they're spread out. McPherson's Ridge is 20,000 people. It's a big fucking ridge. So he's looking over. And he's like, okay, just like I explained before, like at the beginning. And so you you look over at the heights, and it's like you can – like from there, you can barely pick out like the cemetery yeah, just because of that angle. Yeah. You can't see the round top. No. Like, you know oh, what I mean? No. So you're in defilade enough to where that low ground – you're in a valley. But you can see Culp's Hill. You can see Wolf Hill. And you can see Benner. Well, that's three. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm good with like just yeah. tell and none me of them. None of them are behind beyond this town from your perspective. Yeah, none of them are. If you would have given a freaking cardinal direction, hey, seize the heights south of the town. We could have at least worked with it a little bit. Like work with me a little bit, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like if you sent me out to lunch, you know what I mean? And it's like, hey, Jocko, they got there, there's three sandwiches on the menu, and you're just like, just get me a sandwich, and, and then I come back. But you're like, hey, get me one with meat if practicable. <laughs> well, when I get there, it's not practical to get meat sandwich. So I come back with like just like a, a, a veggie, little veggie wrap for you. Yeah, we got problems. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be pissed. So that's the other key. We've, we've talked about this on one of the earlier podcasts, but the word if practicable. The, the problem with that word is it, it, there's such a wide range of perspective on what is practicable and what is not. Because... Look, somebody says, oh, I can take that hill with, you know, no, no more than 20 casualties. That seems practical to me. Someone else is like, hey, I'm not going to lose one person trying to take this hill. You don't, want, you don't want me to lose any guys, do you? Someone else is like, oh, you know, Jackson would be like, oh, you want me to take that hill? Practicable? Oh, it's practical. I don't care what the cost <laughs> is. So you'll so to go into what happens when you'll. So, so you'll decide going to try and do something. Right. Yeah, so Yule is going to make the approach. You know, after a while, they can kind of figure out which height because that's where all the Union are kind of running to. But then, you know, you, when you look at, at Culp's Hill, Culp's Hill is higher in elevation than Cemetery Hill. And remember, I said earlier, there's nobody on Culp's Hill. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? Because, like, like, you and I have been there. Like, I mean, if, if you leave Cemetery Hill, you know what I mean? It, it, if you're looking at it on a map, you're like, oh, that's not very far. That terrain in between the two, man. Like, if you get up in the morning, like, before the staff ride, you know what I mean? Go on a walk and just – because you could go right behind the hotel because the hotel is literally on Cemetery Hill. Walk over to Culp's Hill. Uh, you know what I mean? Just walk it with nobody shooting at you. You know what I mean? In daylight. You know what I mean? It's a beautiful walk. But I, because people love to just, they love the, uh, let's all just drag out Yule and let's just, you know, pounce him around a little bit because he didn't take the freaking hill. Where are those guys coming from? Carlisle. Mm -hmm. Where had they been? They've been walking from Spotsylvania, Virginia in June all the way up to Harrisburg. And this isn't like, you know, they're doing a through hike on the Appalachian Trail, man. You know what I mean? Like, these dudes are in wool underwear, man, making their way around up there. And then now they're going to push south, coming from Carlisle, and they're going to get resistance. They're going to go right into I mean, I, these dudes have got to be tired. They're dragging all their stuff with them. And then you're going to get there, and he's going to get to Culp's Hill. But before he wants to go up the hill... He's going to send a reconnaissance up there. He's not just going to commit everybody because what if somebody's up there? And you know as well as I do, man, that's a steep little mm -hmm. climb, man, to get up to Culp's Hill. And it's a wood lot, so it's wooded. Uh, you know, Now, they are they let the farm animals and stuff like eat the right. underbrush and stuff. So it's not like if you go there today, you're going to see like a lot of underbrush. You could see through the trees, but you can't see well enough because what's also happening towards the end of July 1st? The sun's starting to go down, and it's going to be dark soon. Well, we remembered what happened the last time a commander went forward in the dark. <laughs> it was only a month ago. Mm -hmm. That's his core he has now. Hmm, where's Jackson? He went out monkeying around at dark. Yep. 
You know what I mean? So he's going to send, you know what I mean? Like, like, like a, 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 a reconnaissance of a picket kind of, Hey, you know what I mean? Go on up there, man, and take a look and, and see what's up on there. Even if it's a company, you know what I mean? Cause a company, I mean, send a company up there and they're kind of like online and they're moving slowly up the top of Culp's Hill. You know what I mean? Before he's going to do a full-on commitment. And he also, as he looks at it, he sends a note back to Robert E. Lee. And he wants to know if, like, hey, man, can I get, like, somebody from A.P. Hill? Can he send me, like, a division over to kind of, like, help me out, a brigade? You know what I mean? Can I get some of his folks? I mean, he is the one that got us in a general engagement (laughs) here. Uh, You know what I mean? But – A.P. Hill's kind of spent by this time. If you can imagine, I mean, he's been in battle all day. McPherson's Ridge, all the way to – he's made it all the way to, to the seminary. Right. And he's pushed them all the way through the town. So, uh, you know, so he, Robert E. Lee gets this note from Yule. You know, you know, hey, can I get some reinforcements here, man? And he goes – he basically says, I'll, I'll support you with long-range artillery. Well, dude, long-range artillery is not going to do anything. So, no. No. Yeah. <laughs> And, and Lee has the ability to be like, hey, AP, send a division over, send them over, and you, you're going to attach, just like you had seen before at Chancellorsville. I mean, there was two divisions that were fighting with Second Corps. I mean, Lee has that capability. Yeah, for sure. He's what you would call the dispatcher. Yep. Now, we're, uh, I mean, the Union is also looking at Culp's Hill, luckily, and we got other troops arriving on the battlefield at this time. Yep. And so what happens with the Indiana? Oh, yeah. These, uh, so the Indiana Regiment, because, you know, when uh, when you do that little morning walk up to Culp's Hill, you're going to see this little small monument up there for Indiana. And you're like, huh. Yeah. I mean, if you're from Indiana, you're like, oh, man, Indiana's up here. Badass. Well, how did they get there is kind of the interesting story. So, you know, you've got a logistic train. And then you've got this asshole that's out riding around trying to disrupt all your logistics. So you got to take infantry and you got to put them with the log train to protect the log train. It's an important job. When you you lose logistics, you're done training. So th- this Indiana regiment is back there and, and they're supposed to be protecting the log train. Well, they're infantry. <laughs> Nobody's thrilled when it, cause you're always looking at it like, man, Jocko must not like me because he stuck me with the log train and everybody else is up there. You know, Jason and Steve and them are up there running around Gettysburg and I can hear the battle going on and they're going to be telling stories, man, and I'm missing out. And so that's what these Indiana dudes are standing back there. And I can imagine with the colonel and stuff, you know, they got like the privacy and shit. Sure would be nice to get in the fight, sir. Can't believe you're back here doing this bullshit. You know, typical private stuff. And the colonel's like, you know, he's kind of listening to it. Hey, man, this is a job. This is important, too. Finally, the colonel's like, dude, we're in. <laughs> yeah, they look at the dudes at the log train, you know what I mean, that are just like, these are like contractor folks that are, you know, just dragging wagons and shit, you know what I mean? And they're like, hey, dude, you're on your own. We're getting in this. So Indiana leaves the log train, and they don't tell anybody. They just freaking leave. <laughs> And they make their way, and of course you can hear the gun. But there's a lot of activity going on. You know what I mean? And everybody's up on Cemetery Hill. So these dudes make their way up to Cemetery Hill, and of course, you know you, Howard and any commander that's up there, they just see they got a fresh infantry regiment. They didn't ask them, hey. How'd you get here? What were you supposed to be doing? They're just like, hey, you guys, Indiana? Yeah. Hey, how about go up there and get up on Culp's Hill and occupy Culp's Hill? Because that, nobody's there yet. And it's higher than them, and they need to get somebody up there. Yeah. But they also got to worry about what's in front of them. So they got this, like, they're looking at it as like, hey, man, folks are starting to arrive here. And so Indiana gets up on to Culp's Hill. And, I mean, dude, this is like minutes so Indiana leaves Culp's Hill, or as you were, leaves Cemetery Hill after they've been told, get up there on Culp. They make their way down and through the little valley, and they make their way up onto Culp's Hill on this woodlot. And it's like they get there like literally like a couple of minutes before that reconnaissance effort's being pushed up by Yule. So you could imagine like these dudes in a gunfight, the privates from Yule, and they're moving up toward – I mean, they're going up that hill. One – who wants to fight going up that freaking hill, man? Not me, even still to this day. Because it's a prominent terrain feature in Gettysburg. 
the Indiana gets up there, and they're just stoked to be there. And here they get up there on the military crest, kind of facing to that northerly direction because that's where all the threats kind of coming from. So they get into position, and the next thing you know, man, they see bodies moving up towards Culp's Hill. And what do they do? They just, it's time to, you know, lay the wood. So they start firing down into these Confederates that are making their way up there. What do the Confederate guys do? They turn, they run their ass back down the hill. And, of course, they got officers down there waiting. You know what I mean? Like, hey, what, what's, what's going on up there? They're shooting at us. How many? A hell if I know. You want to know? Take your ass up there and go look. But it's dark. Uh, you know what I mean? I'm not going back up there. So they report that. They report to the command, Yule, of Culp's Hill is occupied. That now it becomes not practicable. <laughs> Which, I mean, come on, man. I mean, these dudes have done a lot of movement. It's not like they haven't done anything that day. And, uh, I mean, and if it's occupied and you've been there, I mean, it's, it's different if you read the book and you kind of, oh, shit, if I was there, I would have taken Culp's Hill, maybe. <laughs> yeah, whatever, dude. Uh, you know what I mean? That, that's, a, that's a steep climb. Uh, so... Then the bad thing is with the privates is they kind of look at it as so when he pulls his folks back off of Culp's Hill and they, they kind of set up in a defensive position. So you got AP Hills over there on the seminary on the seminary ridge, and then you kind of over on the, the north to northeast side of the town, you know what I mean? Towards like that that area of closer to Culp's Hill, that's where Yule's gonna set up. Uh, his folks are gonna be spread out all facing, you know what I mean, south towards Gettysburg, the town, and then towards Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. So that's they're going to set up there, and then A.P. Hill is set up over by the seminary, and they're going to set up their lines on the seminary, and that's going to pretty much end day one. You got, I mean, Reynolds is dead, which put Howard in charge. Yep. How does Meade feel about that? Yeah, uh, when Meade gets the word, again, it gets it all the way down, uh, and he's he's down in Frederick, Maryland, and the dispatch comes down letting them know what the actions – because, you know, these guys are sending couriers back, man, all the time, keeping the commander in the loop. Uh, so the commander's getting that stuff back. Meade gets it, and he's like, man, Reynolds is dead. First thing he does, he's looking at his map. He's like, man, who's the senior guy on the board? And they're like, it's General Howard, sir. Uh-oh. So, uh, interesting is, is uh, he's got his second corps down there with him. Uh, and the second corps commander of the Army of the Potomac, a guy by the name of General Hancock. Uh, and I know we've, we've, mm-hmm. we've kind of talked a little bit about Han- Hancock. He's a good dude. Uh, he's a Pennsylvanian as well. Uh, very, very well respected. Uh, even gets, I mean, the, the pure leadership uh, in the Army of the Potomac has trains dramatically. I mean, you still got a couple of outlier corps commanders that are running around the Army of the Potomac uh, that we'll talk about later. Uh, but for the most part, like, uh, you know, Meade has got some good dudes, and he's got a really good one. Uh, you know, even though he loses Reynolds, Hancock is, is at that level. Uh, he, he's, he's Reynolds' level, uh, in my opinion. Love the guy. Uh, so he's going to basically, he's going to turn to Hancock and he's going to tell Hancock, hey, dude, relinquish your core to Gibbon and make your way to Gettysburg. And I want you to take command of all actions in Gettysburg. <laughs> and Hancock, you know, uh, Hancock knows that there's a little bit of a dilemma with this because he's junior to Howard. So now, you know, how, how's this going to play out? You know what I mean? I'm going to go up to Gettysburg and I'm going to tell a senior officer that se- even though we're both core commanders, you know how it is in the yeah. military, man. I don't care if, you know what I mean? If you, you if two if Marines you, are in a room, one of them is senior man. You're damn right. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? 15 minutes. Like, what <laughs> yeah. is it? I got you. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? And it's just like, dude, they just lined us up for promotion by freaking, you know, by alphabetical order. And you're a B and I'm a Z. So you're, yep, I got promoted yeah. 15 seconds before you boot. And Howard's the kind of guy that seems like the person that would would exercise that kind of seniority all day. Oh, 
In my opinion, most definitely. Yeah, Howard is not going to allow – because how how is that going to look? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, so a junior dude came up and, and, and he just took command of everything? It's going to get out. Everybody's going to see it. Every, everybody in the Army knows the seniority <laughs> in, in the organization. It's not like it's a secret. You know what I mean? Like – uh, so yeah, it, it, he sees that it's going to be a problem, but the cool thing about it is, is, uh, Meade has a letter when he's, when he's designated from Abraham Lincoln to be the, the new army commander, he he's got a letter from Abraham Lincoln that says pretty much, dude, you can promote, you can fire, you can put in charge whoever you see fit. And he's got this letter. And he's going to say, hey, dude, and he tells that to Hancock. Dude, I got this letter, man. Here's the letter. I'm allowed to do whatever the hell I want. I don't care about seniority, man. You're in charge. Get your ass to Gettysburg. So he takes the letter, shoves it in his cargo pocket or his satchel. They didn't have cargo pockets, though. They missed out on a lot. I love a cargo pocket. So, you know what I mean? So he puts it in his satchel, uh, and he's going to start making his way to Gettysburg. And he's going to leave his core there. And but then the core is gonna like so like he's just not gonna be with the movement. But y- you got to look at like you know Meade and a lot of people are like, well, why didn't Meade just like get on his pony and go to Meade's got a lot of stuff to do, man. He had the Pipe Creek circular. He's got to adjust a lot of logistics because all the logistics were coming to support Pipe Creek. Now in a matter of hours. It's gone from Pipe Creek, that's in Maryland, by the way, to Gettysburg, that's in Pennsylvania. 40 so, miles or something. Yeah, like I mean, yeah. So he's got to make all these adjust- You know, amateur study tactics, professional study logistics. We finally have a professional running the Army of the Potomac, in my opinion. So, yeah, he's going to take – and why not, man? Let Hancock – you know, let Hancock go do it. He can do it. He's just as capable. B- badass, in my opinion. So that's what he's going to do, and Hancock's going to make his way – uh, up to Gettysburg. Um, and when he gets up there, uh, Hancock is going to get up to Cemetery Hill and, and, and he's going to see General Howard. And he's thinking about, like, how am I going to deal with this guy when I get there? You know, I mean, knowing that this is just not going to be good. Uh, but he's got some time to think. I mean, always, you know, it seems to me like we never get enough time to think. Like, I love personal time to think. Uh, so he gets this time to think, and he makes his way up, and he gets up there to Cemetery Hill because that's where all the action is. Come up, you know, he comes up over on the, from the east side, comes up onto the back. But as he's making his approach, man, you know what I mean? He's, 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 he's looking at the train. You know what I mean? He's he's looking at everything of how okay, we yeah, we got Culp's Hill, we got cemetery, we got the cemetery ridge line that's running down, we got the the round tops. He goes, dude, this is this is this is good terrain, man. Because he's literally coming up the approach route from Frederick as all the other assets are going to be making their way up. He's like, dude, this is good, and they got interior lines. So it's what like uh, in the book and stuff like that. When you come out there, it, it's kind of hard to – if you lay a map out in front of you and you look at Culp's Hill to Cemetery Hill and then you look down Cemetery Ridge to the round top, it looks like a fish hook. So they're going to have these interior lines with resupply that's going to be protected by this fish hook. So Hancock – Goes up to Howard. He's like, General Howard, you know what I mean? General Hancock, you know how that all, you know, you got to get the formality shit out of the way real quick. And he's like, damn, sir, you've selected some good ground. If you'll allow me, I'll go ahead and, like, start taking over placing folks in. So he literally is convincing Howard that he he selected this ground. And it's, never, like the, it's like the black belt leadership move. Instead of going up, hey, I'm in charge now. Here's my letter from Meade. You need to stand down. He knows that would be like drama, conflict, issues, like just, just, just drama. And instead, he just says, "Hey, hey, sir, looks like you did a great job selecting the ground. If you'll allow me, I'll start putting the troops in, in some spots." And it, it gives him a little ego massage, you know, about what great ground he selected, and you know. Uh, uh, he's like, oh, yep, that sounds good. Go ahead, go ahead, Hancock. You go, go ahead and carry on with that, right? Just and that's what they do. 
Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean the the black and and you know what I love about because this is another thing that like that I think of when I when I'm up there and I always think of of with Hancock. Hancock has the best interest of the private in mind because he knows that if they get into this pissing contest up there and he, I mean, he doesn't even break out the fricking letter from Meade. Like it never even comes up because, you know, Hancock knows what's Howard going to do. Howard's going to get one of these teenage kids. He's going to write a message. Okay. Well, how long does it take to write a fricking message? Uh, you know what I mean? Then he's going to give this message yeah. to a little freaking teenager. Yeah, I've been told that I've, I've been, been relieved told, by Hancock, and I want to debate with this, and I have this. I am the senior man. Yeah. I got to wait for him to go all the way back down, two-hour, three-hour courier on a horse, and get, get with Mead. Mead's got to write something back. But by the, now the fight's over, for, for crying out loud. Yeah, I mean, and who's suffering? Yeah. The freaking private. That's what I love about Hancock, man. He's just like, and then he immediately just goes to work. And Howard is just steps off to the side. Well, of course, you know, horse boy, get my tea and crumpets. You know what I mean? He goes and does Howard shit. Uh, you know what I mean? And, and Hancock goes to work. Uh, and, and then as this is, of course, now what's Hancock going to do? He's sending a note back to his boss, man. Like, yeah, dude, it's on. Yep. We uh, can, this is a good spot. This is a good spot, brother. Uh, you know what I mean? And, well, what, of course, what's Meade going to do? He's going to start to get his way, right. and all the other forces are going to start to make their way to Gettysburg. <sighs> That's awesome. So so they're on their way. And you get this, again, like you're, you're talking about this fish hook that ends up. The lines of the Union end up looking like a fish hook. The top of it is like Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill. They kind of They kind of go east to west, and then it hooks down, and then running north to south, all the way down to Little Round Top is a big chunk of land, a couple miles long, and that ends up being this fish hook shape. Did yeah. I get that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and for folks to get a visual, if you take your right hand and with your you know your pointer finger and your thumb, and you make it in the shape of a fish hook, and then you kind of look at the knuckle of your thumb that 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 first, first knuckle yeah that first knuckle that's kind of like right in there so that would be like Culp's hill yep then you drop down to where the knuckle of your pointer finger that would be cemetery and then your pointer finger that's the cemetery ridge so that is that's you're looking at the fish hook mm-hmm. and then the logistics is running in to that to the fish hook so you've got road networks coming in, and that's interior lines. I mean, look how easy it is to like move resources around inside that fish hook. Yeah. Now, Robert E. Lee on the other side, if you look on the outside of the fish hook, over there by that knuckle of the Cemetery Hill, you got the town, and then Cemetery Ridge is what three quarters of a mile away. Yeah. Well, that's over to the seminary. Well, then you got Yule. That's a you know he's another mile, and he's not even he's on the other side of the town, man. And then when Longstreet finally comes in, well, he's all the way down on the southern end of Seminary Ridge. So for them to move people in and around on those exterior lines, man, that's a lot of movement. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Hancock and these guys getting getting cemetery. And, and you know, you got to look back at Buford, man. He saw this, man. Like, dude, somebody's got to be able to occupy this high ground. Like, if, if we don't occupy this high ground, if Robert E. Lee would have ended up uh, and you know, up there on on the cemetery, and and would have gained Culp's Hill, man, game changer. Uh, but again, you know, if well, then Meade hopefully wouldn't have fought him there and just stayed down by Pikes Creek, yep, Pikes pulled. Creek, and yep. said, okay, "Cool, and come, that's, come and get DC." I guess. Yep, that's probably what he would have done. He wouldn't have like thrown more resources at just a, like he's not going to go up there and then just like throw resources and start attacking to try to take you know Cemetery Hill. It doesn't mean shit to him. That's not his. He, he just has right. to protect Baltimore. You can stay in Gettysburg all day long, brother. <laughs> as long as you stay out of D.C. and Baltimore, I'm keeping my job. So that's where we end up uh, uh, on the end of day one is, you know, you got the, the fish hook form with the Union troops. The You could say that the Confederate troops are also in a fish hook. It's just way, way, way more spread out, more expanded. It's like... Just it, it's just a giant arcing, arching, you know, spread out of troops that they're in. Yeah, a huge 180, man. Yeah. I mean, because they're trying to cover that that entire frontage. I mean, and 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 again, they they don't have as many people. Uh, and and yeah, like you said, uh, 
you know, the first Corps commander of James Longstreet for the Army of Northern Virginia, he, he's not even a player of day one. So he's going to show up, you know, that night uh, mm-hmm. it, coming into Gettysburg. And then Meade is putting the rest of his army, uh, and they're all moving towards Gettysburg. So now it's all like, let's all giddy up and and let's see how this is going to go down. And the other cool thing about after the end of day one, once Meade takes care of all of his like general stuff and sends notes back to, because he's got his boss, he's got to keep the boss informed. He sent his stuff back to D.C., Uh, he's 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 got a little bit of a ride to get to Gettysburg. And it's at night, you know what I mean. So it's it's late in the evening. He packs up his camp and he hops in to a back of a. He's going to jump in the back of a wagon. Going to get in the back of a wagon, and he's going to take a nap <laughs> on the way to Gettysburg because he knows when he gets there, it's game on, and I need to be. There's nothing he can do no. on the ride up. So I think that's that's pretty cool that the commander he understands like. I'm not going to get rest for the next couple of days. I'm going to go up against a dude that's seven zero and one. You know what I mean? This isn't the Pipe Creek plan. I've lost John Reynolds. You know what I mean? Like, and and I, this is and he knows what's happened to every commander before him. Like, you're going to be out of a job quickly. <laughs> You're going to lose, and then you're going to get fired. <laughs> yes. I mean, we know that there's a certain sequence that it's not like anything that's, like, mind-blowing. Uh, so he, he jumps in the back of an ambulance, you know, and he, uh, he's going he's gonna to ride up in the back, and he's going to take a nap. And the other cool thing about Meade is, is when he does get to Gettysburg that evening and he gets up there to call, he is personally going to ride the lines, and he's going to sketch the lines personally and he's gonna he knows in his mind how the units are going to arrive the other core you know what i mean so he knows these other core are going to be approaching and he wants to know what chunk of the line because he's an engineer he knows you give me you know what i mean you give me five thousand people this is how many this is how much space five thousand people can take and then I got another 5,000, and I got another 5,000. So he's going to literally sketch out at night, writing his lines personally, so that when these folks arrive, they're not waiting around. Like, have you ever gone somewhere and you're like waiting around, waiting to be told what to do? We love that. You know what I mean? I love when you like show up somewhere, you immediately know what you're doing. Yep. Hey, here's your piece of terrain. Here's where you want your people. Here's where your uh, fields of fire are. You good to go? Yep, good to go. Yep. I mean, everything's already done. We know exactly what we're doing. I mean, it's like us. We show up here at the beginning of the week. I wasn't like standing around, waiting, <laughs> monkeying around like two or three days. What the hell we're doing? Dude, we've been at it. <laughs> like literally. Uh, you know what I mean? It's been game on every day. Uh, you know what I mean? Because we know what the fuck we're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we've got a plan. I love that. <laughs> uh, and, and that's what Mead does. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, so Mead, Mead's a good dude. Uh and at some point, Lee decides it's on. We're going to fight here. Oh, yeah. Like, this is where we're going to yep. do it. Day one, because at the end of day one, and I, I need, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about this because everybody always likes to discuss. Okay, so you, you're at the end of the day one. You got uh, the, the Union Army. They're over on the, the Cemetery Hill uh, in the Fish Hook. And then you've got the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, the Confederates are over on the Seminary. Uh, so, like, who won day one? Yeah, well, that depends on your perspective. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, the the Confederates killed one of the premier generals. You know, killed. They pushed. They pushed him back off McPherson. Pushed him back off Seminary, and all the way onto Cemetery Ridge. So that feels pretty good. But that being said, you got you got the Union, and the Union has now kind of. Uh, Align themselves on a really nice prominent terrain feature Kind of You know, I wouldn't I'm, I you know, they do they do this thing with the UFC now where they do they show what the odds are at the end of each round They're like oh at the beginning of the fight, you know Everyone thinks this guy's gonna win now at, at round two after you saw round one who's winning now That's kind of what we're doing right now, and it'd be a, it'd be a hard one I don't think the I don't think you could call it any easier right now than you could before day one because you're like well 
I mean, they both have some advantages. Like, we got some momentum. Like, if I'm in the Confederates, I'm like, hey, we got some momentum. We pushed you off of two terrain features. We killed some of your leadership. Like, we we pushed you all the way back to this last terrain feature. We'll be up tomorrow morning ready to kick your ass again. Meanwhile, the other side's like, well, we did a like nice defense in depth. We took some casualties, but now we've got awesome reinforcements coming in. And we're in a prominent terrain feature. Good luck tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the only thing that we know is is both coaches, Meade and Lee, they're both the, – the message they're sending out to their people is, damn right we won today. Hmm. You know what I mean? We're going to smoke check them tomorrow. And when you look at Meade, Meade wanted to be in a defensive position. Yeah. And he's in a – I mean, he's – I mean, that's what – I mean – I, I you, you got you got to come up to Gettysburg, you know what I mean, to to, to see it, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, of where they are uh, and the location on there, man. And and Meade is in a good spot, uh, but again, I mean, dude, thirty days ago we were just talking about like Robert E. Lee and Jackson with like three to one odds, and went out fourteen miles with a freaking teenager as a scout and smoke checked them, you know what I mean? So don't be thinking he's over there. And so and Meade knows what he's up against. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is Bobby Lee. Uh, and so, you know, Robert E. Lee is going to immediately, his OODA loop's going to go go into, into thought uh, of day two. And Longstreet arrives. Uh, and Longstreet's going to come into the tent. Uh, and Lee, he's going to want to fight here at Gettysburg. Uh, and Lee's going to come up to where his, his, his initial plan is – that he briefs to Longstreet and the Corps commanders of this is what we're going to do to this tomorrow morning. This is what we're doing. He's going to have, you know, basically he's going to take – Hill is going to stay in position. So he's basically, you know, he's going to be like the support by fire position. He wants Longstreet that wasn't engaged at all on day one. So he's Should got, be pretty fresh. He's got some fresh guy. Now, they did walk there. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to take anything away from the hike. But they, they didn't get in it. They haven't fired around yet. So these guys are fresh, and it's his old war horse. So he's going to be the focus of main effort. So if, you know, on that road, when you're sitting up on the seminary road, if you look down behind the seminary back towards the west, there's that black horse tavern road that runs back down there. But there's not really good roads back there. Uh, but there's enough to where he can drop down off the military crest and then he's going to head south and then he's going to come and cross over of what is the Emmitsburg Pike Road, you know, that Emmitsburg, because if you go south of Gettysburg, you run into Emmitsburg, Maryland. Uh, you're literally, Gettysburg is very close to the Maryland line of Emmitsburg. Uh, and then you, he's going to cross over the Emmitsburg Road, and then just like we talked about how Jackson did on the Plank Road when we talked about Chancellorsville, he's going to straddle that road, uh, you know what I mean? And he's going to push from the south to the north, you know what I mean? And and he's going to get that extreme left flank of the Union Army. Uh, and so basically, basically, Lee is like, hey, uh, remember Chancellorsville? Remember what we did down there? We we flanked him. And that's what we're going to do here. You're going to kind of we're on this. We're on the cemetery seminary ridge. Just bump back off the ridge a little bit. They won't be able to see you. Walk south. Once you walk south far enough, hook a left, and you're going to be on their left flank. We're going to roll them up just like we did down at Chancellorville. That's that's the essentially what Lee wants to do. Yeah, I mean that's what and and Lee sends a reconnaissance. You know what I mean? He sends a couple of his engineers around there prior just to to get eyes on. You know what I mean? He wants to to run a reconnaissance, and Longstreet sends some of his guys with. The guys with Lee, so he's sending some of his own folks on this reconnaissance, and they get in around it. And if you if you go south off the seminary and you get on the on the on the uh, Emmitsburg Pike Road and you come back up north, like you're coming into Gettysburg, uh, up there you're going to see like it's very prominent the peach orchard. And when those guys go out and around and they're they're kind of like sneaking up, they're trying to get a, they don't want to get in a gunfight. They're doing reconnaissance. When they look into up there on the peach orchard up there, there's like maybe not even a couple hundred guys. 
And then they're going to make their way back out and around, and they're going to come back over, and they're going to tell Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet, you know what I mean, and 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 the commanders there that, yeah, dude, there, there's just there's just a couple hundred dudes, man, mm-hmm. and over. their flank is kind of in the air. As yeah, we oh, say. it's in the like, air. It was like we just rolled up there. Yeah, like dude, l- let's giddy up and go. And Longstreet, he, he has a different vision of what he thinks they should do. And he tells Robert E. Lee, he tells Bobby, he's like, hey, man, why don't we just, like, screw Gettysburg and let's go south and east and let's get in between D.C. and the Army of the Potomac, kind of like what Meade was going to do. <laughs> so he's got the same vision as Meade. Get in between them. We can pick the defensive ground. It's going to force their hand yeah. To come down and hit us, man. Let's not do this offensive thing. Let's go down there. And and a lot of people. I mean, does does that is that a viable plan? Sure. But if you go down there and you threaten, I always look at it as the only reason why. Because you got you know you got to kind of look at the fence of like, okay, why wouldn't Robert E. Lee do that? That makes perfect freaking sense, man. Well, is that going to leave your logistics exposed? You go down there, man. You know what I mean? Like, if you push in and get in between, that doesn't mean that George Gordon Meade has to come hit you. He could go straight for your logistics. I mean, your logistics train, dude. Like, you're you're not set up logistically like the Army of the Potomac is. Your logistics train's running back to the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, man. Uh, You know what I mean? So, logistically, he's on borrowed time. To be able to do all this movements, where is he going to get the food? Where is he going to get the forage? How is he going to take – you bring the Army together, you know what I mean? They're going to – like when we talked about it on the, on the, on the uh, previous uh, podcast about like how many horses are there. If you look at the fields of Gettysburg, if you put all those horses there, 25,000 horses, that place is dirt in a day. They're going to eat every ounce of grass, and you're going to have dirt there. Like, there's just not enough to support that many people. I mean, you're bringing in, coming into the little town of Gettysburg, now you've got both armies, and they're literally in a six-mile square radius. And you know, and, and there's 165,000 people there with their horses. That town can't support even today. Like at the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg, that was you know a few years back, dude, they had to redo the bridging. They had to like structurally get ready for the 150th anniversary because millions of people were coming to Gettysburg. So they weren't you know, back then. Like that's just a lot of people. So he's on borrowed time, and Robert E. Lee wants to get him and wants to get him now. And let's just let's get this over with. So he comes up with the plan. He lets Longstreet kind of have this peace with him in the tent, and then he tells James, this is what we're doing, and this is what I want you to do. And James Longstreet leaves the tent because everybody else of Hill and Yule are like Longstreet's the focus of main effort. So everybody else is kind of waiting on him to move. So everybody else is standing by. Because once he executes this flanking maneuver from the south, Yule and Hill are then going to also attack. Is that right? Yeah. Well, Yule's more or less going to be that support base. You know what I mean? Of hitting them because they're all within artillery range. You know what I mean? You've seen mm-hmm. like Hill's lines are like right across. So they can stay there. But yeah, then like then Yule is going to start attacking Culp's Hill. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Because that is still the most prominent terrain. Fee- the, to, to let everybody kind of know, when you go to Culp's Hill, if you control Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, you control that road network at Gettysburg. That is why it is so key. Like everybody like wants to go down and, and everybody gets up on the round tops, right? You know what I mean? Which is it, it is gonna come into play later, but you don't control any road networks no. from the round top. You, when you control the round tops, you just control the round tops. That, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Not much to control there. No. So so the, so so you know we have a big leadership discussion about the fact that you know Lee's basically says shut up and do what I told you to do. It's basically what he says. Which if you're in a leadership position, and that's where it comes to, you're probably not 
you're probably not doing the right thing. There's probably so you probably should open your ears a little bit. Let's pay, listen to what people are saying. It's never a good sign when you have to tell someone, "Hey, I'm the boss. You be quiet. You go do what I told you to do." And that's essentially what happens here. And it becomes pretty evident that there's like resistance from Longstreet with this plan because he doesn't you know uh, he doesn't suck it up and say hey Roger that boss got it I'm on board going to execute he doesn't really do that he kind of slow rolls and and pauses and hesitates and instead of this being a, like a pretty rapid action which, by the way, we know that the, none of these actions are that rapid. When you got thirty thousand guys, you got to move. And if you're not, if you're not making it happen, if you're not, hey, everyone, get, get in here. This is what we're doing. This is how we're actually. If you're not doing, it, if you don't have that sense of urgency in your freaking voice, like as step number one, if people can't hear it in your voice, you're already lagging, right? When I go down and say, hey, this is the plan, guys. We're like already, we, we already lost fifteen minutes from the tone of my voice. <laughs> So when I go down, hey, listen up, gents, this is what's happening. Okay, well, oh, I just gained four minutes, right? People understand that. So the sense that I get, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of making a caricature out of this, of like Longstreet's slow rolling this thing. I mean, how many times doesn't Lee have to go down multiple times? Like, bro, what's going on? Yeah, because I mean, you, you know, from from uh, you know, when you're there at the Virginia Monument. Where his headquarters are. I mean, you can you can see right down the summit. And, and when you're moving, like when you're moving fifteen thousand people, it's not like you're hiding. You know what I mean? Like everybody can see. And he's looking down there because he knows he's got to drop off the military crest back by the Black Horse Tavern Road, and he's got to make his way south. And Lee's kind of looking down there, like, why isn't anybody moving? Because you remember thirty days ago when we were talking about like when you read with Jackson. Like was up before everybody mm-hmm. else was already people on the road and move. You know what I mean? Like already, he's a, already got a scout, already got maps, man. Dude, I mean, he's he's on. He's it. on it. Yeah, and like you said, like long street and, and whatever it is. Yeah, maybe Lee should have been like, "Why are you not like what? Am I not explaining this one? Did your guys not get to go over and look in the peach orchard, man? There's a couple hundred dudes over there, man. Their their flank is in the air." Like what? 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 Why do you have a problem with that, man? Like what? What's up? Mm-hmm. I mean, I get you're my defense guy. I got it. Uh, you know what I mean? But we need to go offense. You can play both sides yeah. of the ball. And even man. when Longstreet goes like, "Hey, man, why don't we just go down there and set up a? You know, we'll make them attack us." He's like, "Hey, listen, bro. I get it. That would be cool. Our logistics can't handle that. Here's why. Explain it to him. So we gotta. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I didn't really think of that. Cool. Let's go do this. Let's get it done. Let's get it over with." This doesn't sound like that happened. Doesn't sound like there was good unity of command behind this thing. Yeah, and and you know, and this is where you're kind of you're kind of seeing behind the curtain, the command climate's kind of taking a little bit of a change in the Army of Northern Virginia. You know, on the approach route, seven zero and one man, dudes are stoked. Uh, now you're kind of seeing a little bit of friction. Uh, coming in in the Army of Northern Virginia in that command climate was just like you said. The the command climate can change with just in less in seconds, you know what I mean, of a change of command, Mm -hmm. going from one person to the next. I mean, literally. The, the outlook, the tone of the organization yeah. well, can change. I remember on one of the podcasts you were talking about when Jackson by himself showed up and the troops are like, hey, there's Jackson. We're good to go. But now you don't have him anymore. You know, no. th- th- Those were Longstreet's guys, by the way, that was like, we're good. We got Jackson just showed up. We're good. So, yeah, there's like a maybe they're not quite as confident as they were. Yeah, and and so he's going to go back, and you know how that's all going to kind of it, it's all going to play out with some of the folks of you know he's got uh, you know his his division commanders of of Hood and some of the folks that are there, so they're going to see this and and they already know because you know in a core they're going to have discussions before Longstreet goes in the tent. Longstreet and them are probably doing map two, so they can figure out like hey when we go in there we want to have a plan for the boss. You know what I mean? Like if you're going into the meeting. Normally you prep and you're like, okay, I'm going to try to convince the boss. This is what we're going to do tomorrow. You know what I mean? So Longstreet's not an idiot, man. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a competent core commander. Uh, I'm not taking anything away from him, but then when he gets out and he's not necessarily 
you know, Lee's not buying in with the plan, so he's going to walk out and he's dragging his feet. And then he's going to, yeah, if Robert E. Lee has to get on his freaking horse, man, and come down a couple of times, even one time of like, why aren't you moving yet, man? Because that reconnaissance effort, dude, that's that's old news, yeah. man. You know, so the longer you wait, so it literally is going to go like all day, man. Because now, again, just like you said, you're trying to move that many people. Okay, 15,000 people, you're going to drop down. You're going to go south. You're going to get them out. You're going to deploy online. You're going to straddle a freaking road, man. That takes hours. At best. Yeah, at best, man. <laughs> hours. So by the time he gets out and around and straddles the road and starts to make his way like as if he's going to go into the attack, they can you can see the peach orchard. Mm-hmm. Well, the Peach Orchard doesn't have a couple of hundred folks in there, man. There's a couple of thousand dudes in the Peach Orchard now. Well, no shit. It's been six hours, man. You know what I mean? Like, so now him, Robert E. Lee, and now he's looking at it like, but that's more than what we were expecting. So now they got to call an audible. So they, now it's not a flank. And then now it's when they're, so him and Robert E. Lee are going to come up with this in echelon. Mm-hmm. And and to before oh, we jump into the echelon though, how do we end up with a few thousand people in in the peach orchard? Because when we look at this, when we do that, we need to get out our right finger or our, our right hand, and we look at this fish hook. The peach orchard is not on our index finger. It's not on the fish hook. It is what uh, almost a mile pushed out. How far is it? How far is the peach orchard? Outside of the fish hook, three quarters of a mile. Oh, at least, yeah, three quarters easy. So it is not part of the fish hook. So you end up with this unit out there that's not unified with everybody else. Tell us about how that happens because there's a story behind that one. Oh, and it's funny you should ask. Like, what the? I mean, they're not out there picking peaches. I can tell you that. And and if you look at it to give that descriptive, like you know when we stand up there, like at the if you stand at the at the north. Uh, end of Little Round Top where the, the road is that's right there at the base and you drop down you've got you drop down and it's that uh, the Plum Run Valley so you got this Plum Run which is basically a creek uh, but it's a low area and it's always like you know it's kind of marshy uh, and then you kind of come up and, and, and as you're coming up you've got this uh, there's the wheat field so now you've got a wheat field and then you get to the peach orchard. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's easily three quarters of a mile all the way up to that Emmitsburg Road. Mm-hmm. And at the Emmitsburg Road, that is where, like, when they the peach orchard's up there, that's where a couple hundred. Now there's a couple of thousand, and you're spot on, man. Like, it, it the peach orchard is not even anywhere close. Like, you couldn't screw it up. You know what I mean? If it's like, hey, I want you to put your people here on the cemetery ridge. Like, it is not a part. You go down and through a valley, across a creek, up through a wheat field to get to the peach orchard. Dude, you are nowhere near <laughs> the cemetery freaking ridge. So, Meade has this perfect line drawn out, this perfect fish hook. He's got every position la- laid out. He puts these guys in the fish hook. Then the, the person that's in charge that he puts in position is this guy named Sickles. And like you said, Sickles, because look, in the spot where Sickles was at on the fish hook, when you don't see the big picture, it doesn't feel optimal, right? Because like you said, you're looking a little bit uphill, like it, there's some better terrain out there as you look out. So you, you can see where if you don't take the whole plan into consideration, if you don't think about what the guys on my right, what the guys on my left, what the guys two, three, four units to my left, two, three, four units to my right, if you don't think about what they're doing and how my unit plays into this completing this picture, that's where you run into a problem. And that's the problem that Sickles had. Sickles isn't thinking about the unity of this whole line. He's just thinking about himself. So what's up with Sickles? Yeah, uh, you know, like, I, I believe like every pocket, every time we, we talk about a general, uh, I'm always like, well, you know, he's a West Point grad. And you're like, well, that, that doesn't seem to be adding up to much. Well, th- this time I'm going to, I'm going to uh, blow your hair back a bit. And Dan Sickles is not a West Point grad. He's a politician from New York. Uh, and he is very well connected. 
uh, all the way to Stanton. Uh, you know what I mean? Like he's that kind of connected. Uh, at New York City, uh, you know, senator. You know what I mean? Even still to this day in 2022, man. You know what I mean? New York, Europe. I mean, that's that's a big deal, man. Uh, but Dan Sickles, uh, he's the third core commander. Uh, in the Army of the Potomac, uh, and you know he 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 becomes a, I mean one thing that I the one thing he's brave, that you know what I mean like he he's he he's brave, but he doesn't know what he's doing, uh, and Dan Sickles I mean he's brave and stupid is not stu- a great yeah, I not mean, a great yeah, combo no not especially at all. when you're in charge look you get a nug that's brave and stupid bro that might, that guy might be getting a silver star or a navy cross or something that that does, that's just how it might go down you get someone that's in charge and they're brave and they're stupid we could get a bunch of people killed right so he he gets that section of the line and Jocko you were spot on I mean if you're standing there like where he was like kind of supposed to be on the cemetery but he doesn't he doesn't understand the big picture. He doesn't care the big. I mean, he's legally insane, like legally. Mm-hmm. Been, and, and that happened, uh, you know. So Dan Sickles, you know, he's uh, what is he? he's forty three in Gettysburg, uh, and he's got a wife, and and she's like sixteen. Well, Dan Sickles, being the politician that he is. Uh, you know, he has a stable of women that he kind of has on the side to include his wife. And his wife doesn't necessarily care much that her husband is keeping a stable of women on the side. So while he's off, you know what I mean, doing his stuff, and she's and they're living right there in D.C., you know what I mean, he's, you know, for the center. See, they're in D.C. She decides to get a boyfriend. Well, then when, like, Dan Sickles finds out about this boyfriend, he's pissed. Well, uh, you know, when I say the last name of, like, back in those days, like, Keys. Like, have you ever heard of that song, The Star Spangled Banner, written by that dude, Keys? Well, uh, this is Keys' son that's having an affair with Sickles' wife. So Sickles is literally going to call the dude out. At Lafayette Park, right across from the White House in Washington, D.C., to a duel. And he's going to shoot this dude multiple times and kill him. Right in front, I mean, in D.C. And and Stanton is going to defend him. And Sickles is going to be the first person in American history to get off on a temporary insanity plea. So this dude is... Uh, and, and you're kind of like, you know, you're staring at me like right now, like every time, whenever you hear the story, because you can't just make this stuff up, man. This is like crazy stuff. And you're like, well, how the hell did this guy become a general? I thought you had to be like a, a West Point grad. Well, yes. But if you can recruit a lot of people to come in, they're going to give you rank for it. I mean, we even still do it today in the military. You send me home on like recruiter's assistant. You know what I mean? They're like, hey, JD, if you can if you can convince two of your buddies to join the Marine Corps, we're going to make you an E3. Bro. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Yeah. Badass. So I'm going to bullshit these guys to get them in because I can't wait to be a Lance Corporal. I'm going to be in charge of shit. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, this here, man, like if you recruit 10,000 people, dude, we're going to make you a freaking general. Well, so how does he recruit how those people? Well, if you're a senator and you're in New York City, he's just going to shut down all the firehouses and he's going to put all the firemen and put them into the army. And bam, I'm a general. And that's exactly what he did. Yeah. So up there right outside of the Peach Orchard, there's actually a, a super cool New York monument. And it, it's a, a monument. It has a, 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 an F, a, a fire fireman and he's standing next to a soldier. You know what I mean? It's right there, up there uh, by the peach orchard. Uh, and it just, it's showing that, you know, one because when some of them were like, well, hey, dude, like it, it, the, the folks in, in fire, both wildland fire, structure fire, uh, you know what I mean? The brotherhood inside that, man, is just huge. And there, it's no different in 1860. I mean, those guys that are in the firehouse, man, they, they are just uh, phenomenal human beings. And it's like, okay, if one goes, dude, we're all going. So they all come. Uh, and but that's how uh, Sickles, and when he goes into the into the peach orchard, it's not like he's like in any kind of like 
defense. He 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 forms this salient, which is a salient is like a V. Mm-hmm. So if you're in this V formation, if if I if if orientated, if you're looking at the peach orchard, so you're he's basically the pointy end of the V is is basically facing west. And then you've got the left side of the V. Well, that's where Longstreet and those guys are coming up from the south. The north side of the V can't shoot over at anybody coming up from the south because you're literally shooting through your own people. So you've basically taken out half of your force. Then, man, he's trying to cover such a large area with his core that he doesn't have enough people. So he's got gaps in his line. So here's how genius this guy is. He's going to fill the gaps with artillery. Now, artillery, you know, they've got a different job than infantry. Like they kind of like this is a big piece of gear uh, and it takes more than one person to operate it. You know what I mean? So you got this this artillery crew, uh, you know what I mean? And they're kind of focusing on the gun. They don't they can't focus to see who's coming at them. So normally you have infantry supporting the artillery to protect the artillery. I mean, even artillery back there, even and still to this day, I mean, artillery is considered the king of the battle. You know what I mean? I mean, it's a uh so you have artillery unsupported by infantry. Dude, that is a that's a huge mistake because these guys are trying to like load the gun, aim the gun, fire the gun, reload the gun. And oh, by the way, this gun, when you fire it, it's not like on TV. That piece of artillery jumps about 10 to 12 feet back. When they pull the lanyard, dude, this thing is jumping. You talk about something that you weigh in tons jumping 12 feet back. So it's a dangerous job. Uh, you know what I mean? Just within itself of of being in the artillery back then. And and they're not carrying rifles. They don't get a rifle because their job is working the gun. That's why you put infantry with them. So Sickles is also going to have artillery filling in gaps and they're unsupported by infantry. He's just, I mean, just incredible uh, of what, what Sickles does. And the bad thing about it is, is people find you're always under observation. So as soon as Sickles starts making his way out to the peach orchard, word's going to get back to George Gordon Meade. You know, George Gordon Meade is going to send people out there. He's going to tell Sickles six times to get his people back on the cemetery ridge. Six times. I don't know if everybody heard that. Six times he's going to tell. This is an army commander telling a corps commander, get your people. And this is before they're not in battle yet. You know what I mean? Like nobody's hit them yet. He's told them. George Gordon Meade has his son that it's there and working on his staff. His, his son goes out. And everybody knows it's George Gordon Meade, Lieutenant Meade. You know what I mean? He comes out. You know, sir, general, you need to get back to the seminary. Yep, whatever. You know what I mean? He's, he's legally insane. I do whatever the hell I want. It finally takes George Gordon Meade, who probably has some other stuff to do, now personally has to leave his headquarters and make his way. All So you, you remember where his headquarters is? He's over there closer to the cemetery hill. So he's kind of like, and he's close to the line. I mean, he's like right up on yeah, the line. He's just, like 100 yards or something from oh, the dude, line. Oh, dude, yeah. 100 lives right on the military crest. And he's going to get on his horse, and he's going to ride all the way down the cemetery ridge and out to the peach orchard where he's going to meet with uh, with this guy, Sickles. And he's going to, like, tell Sickles. And Sickles kind of sees him coming. He's like, oh, shit, really? The boss is here. <laughs> so he's, like, looking at me, and he's kind of like, okay, yeah, hey, I'll get him. And it was almost like on cue, Meade looked at him and said, I don't think they're going to let you. And here comes the Confederates. And they've caught him all out there in a salient, in the peach orchard, in the wheat field, spread out, gaps, and it's just not going to go good. Uh 
Yeah, unsupported, you know? We always talk about cover and move. Like, these guys got themselves into... Well, they couldn't even cover for themselves. Like you said, they'd cut off their own firing. They couldn't support each other. They weren't supported by the rest of the line. It's just a complete, complete nightmare. Um, Those guns, you got kind of a badass with those guns. Bigelow. Oh, yeah. Uh, (laughs) One of my favorite uh, stories is the retreat by (laughs) Prolonge. Right, talk me through that. What Bigelow has to do because he's got these guns that weigh several tons. They're getting pushed on hard. It's not like they got time to, you know, hitch horses back up and turn them around and tow them out of there while while totally unsupported by infantry. So he takes another method. Yeah, and and you know, we still do them to this day, man. Gun drills. You know, machine gunners do it. Artillery does it. Mortars guys do it. I mean, they they operate gun drills. Uh, and if you see a, a good gun crew you know what i mean do it's like it's theater man uh, like i mean that shit could be on broadway you know what you i mean and i were talking the other day like the first time i saw marine corps mortar team i was like hmm i could watch this for a while i want to video this <laughs> this is what <laughs> professionalism looks like yeah i mean it's and, and i'm terrible at it uh, you know what i mean like I, i'm just uh, 0311 rifleman yeah I, I i can pull a bolt to the rear and put it back that's that's my capabilities the mortarman next level like artillery guys man next level with these gun drills well you know how like not every gun crew is the same because they all have their own leader that's in charge of that gun crew and uh and and some some gun crews man like bigelow is that kind of a of a crew leader that he is constantly drilling the basics like just repetition to where, like you said, like when we were chit chatting the other day, Matt, about the Mortarman. I told you, like with Eric Carlson, he's probably the best Mortarman I've ever seen. Like, like it's phenomenal. And I can't do Eric Carlson. There's no way he's just that good. That's Bigelow, man. He's just that, and he's just repetition with the crew. And of course, the crew's kind of like they're looking at the other crews, like, man, those dudes are sitting in the shade, man. They're like. You know, drinking yoo-hoos, you know, having a good time. And here we're over here, man, just constantly doing to my Bigelow is such an asshole, man. But when Bigelow's preparing them for this moment, because everybody knows that Bigelow runs the best gun crew. And, you know, when we talk about, like, this prolonge, uh, to try to, like, it's a leather strap like if if you've got and everybody who has seen this, if if you've got a vehicle and you're towing a camper, right? You've got this this hitch that goes on to the ball, right? Two inch, three inch, whatever. You got mm-hmm. the hitch, but then you also you get these chains that you can then hook in, and that's like the secondary way to move it. That's not the primary way. But do you ever practice towing? With just the chains? No. <laughs> well, Bigelow does. Uh, you know what I mean? So that's the pro launch of, of the piece of artillery. It's this leather strap. Uh, you know what I mean? So he, so these guys know how to to operate using the pro launch. So literally, as everybody, because Meade has to make a decision. He he can't leave Sickles's core out there just to hang to dry. So he immediately goes back. And oh, by the way, his horse gets spooked and he gets like rode off for a little while. You know, just you know, when shit's going wrong, like it seems like everything starts to go wrong. <clears throat> so Meade, on his way back, he's got to start pulling resources because now they're they're getting attacked. It's Longstreet's core. You know what I mean? Sickles is not where he's supposed to be. Nothing's happening yet. Over at you know Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill, because remember everything's going off of the focus of main effort, uh, and they're going to do this echelon. So he's going to have to start pulling resources to get Sickles out of the peach orchard and back to the cemetery. Huge, I mean, and, and as if George Gordon Meade has nothing better to do. Well, when this is all kind of happening. They're pulling the folks back and they look at Bigelow and they're like, hey, dude, you're going to have to hold these folks off while the rest of us get out. So and when you go there and you know, we've we've been there and, and you're looking back across the field uh, heading towards the uh, the cemetery ridge, he's literally going to 
hold off the Confederate infantry, and he's going to start jumping his artillery guns 10 to 12 feet at a time all the way back across the field. You know what I mean? While still fire, like, you know what I mean? Like with artillery, I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Uh, so that's, that's a, that's Bigelow. Uh, you, you started to go into it before I kind of cut you off and, and asked you about Bigelow, the ash the new echelon plan that's come about. Yeah, so when you when you say like echelon, it's all French terms, man. Everybody's out running around with French textbooks trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? So they're going for the last guy, you know what I mean? Of it's the Napoleon. Uh, so this is this in echelon. So to cut so probably pretty much everybody, you know, in America, even if you don't like it, you've probably watched a football game once in your life. So it's basically they're going to try to pull off a draw play on a massive scale. So meaning with that is they're going to attack with a a four o'clock attack and then a five o'clock attack. And then what's this doing is it's drawing the resources down so that when you get a six o'clock attack, there's not enough resources in the line and you break through the lines. Does that kind of make sense? Yep. So yep. and Long Street, because because they can't just not just a regular flank anymore, right? Because there's too many people in the peach yep. orchard, so that thing is out the window. So now they're like, all right, that's not going to work out. A regular flank's not going to work out. So this is the beginning of an echelon attack. You're the four o'clock attack, Long Street. You're the four o'clock attack. You're the initial assault. That's going to start drawing Union forces down. Then we're going to hit him with the next guy up at 5 o'clock. That's going to draw even more people down. At 6 o'clock, hopefully so many people are drawn down that we can get through. And we'll keep doing that all the way up, you know, the 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 uh, Confederate lines. Yeah, because not, not only are they changing the game plan on the southern end of the battlefield, he's also got to send a note up to Yule. So he's basically doing two draw plays one at the south end, four, five, and six, and then Yule's going to do seven, eight, nine to be able to draw again because, dude, they still want Culp's Hill. Mm -hmm. So he's going to have, you know what I mean, a six o'clock, a seven o'clock, and, you know, all the way through. So you kind of, kind of get these, these draw plays. The problem is, and they're going to use like divisions with their brigades. You know what I mean? So these brigades of drawing them out. And it's this huge draw play, getting everybody to one side of the field, and then you're just going to scoot right around the other side with a little bit of resistance. You know what I mean? You're going to get a touchdown. So it makes sense, right? But they're calling it on the fly. And the other kind of problem of it is, is uh, yeah, like I said, this is the wheels are coming off the cart, man, because – you're like, okay, well, if they're doing this echelon, how the hell do we end up over on the round top? Well, that's because when that first four o'clock attack decides, that, yeah, I'm not going to the peach, uh, the peach orchard. I'm going to the round tops. He just disobeyed orders. So instead of going north, he just turns east and heads towards the round tops. He sees who's that? It's Hood. Hood. Hood sees the round tops, and they're they're nice looking terrain, okay. especially when you look at them from that far to the west because when you look at him at that far to the west it looks like you just got a nice flat kind of run up to him that you can get up on this high ground yeah it looks like because it's a wheat field <laughs> so you see the peach orchard to the wheat field and, and you and i we we talked about the plum run and we talked about that marsh area but we left one little key terrain feature that's down that you can't see from up there no and that's what we call devil's den now devil's den when you get to see Devil's Den, like, and you're up there and you drive down those boulders and mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, it's just amazing. And it didn't get the name Devil's Den from the battle. That's what the town folk called Devil's Den. Devil's Den was like one of those areas that was like snakes and stuff. And that's where the devil hung out. So I always kind of look at it as like, you know, when you're a teenager, you know what I mean? And you want to like, you know, you want to go on a date. You're going to go park out at Devil's Den because it's out of town. You know what I mean? You got these cool rocks. I look at it like if you created like a like a video game battlefield where you're just going to have like obstacles and rocks and just weird looking cool stuff that you'd want to run around in a video game. You'd make Devil's Den. That's what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Most definitely. But you don't want it. 
So as he's making his way to the round tops, uh, you know what I mean? Then you run into this formation of rock, like a spine mm-hmm. that just comes up out to where now you've got this rock formation, and then you've got the plum run, and then you got to go uphill to get to Little Round Top. So we'll basically be talking about, because you know, in the books and a lot of the readings, they just call them the Round Tops. But when you're there, there's a definite difference between Little Round Top and Big Round Top. Uh, and the rock formations, when you look at the front of Little Round Top, are pretty prominent yep. uh, up there. You see that granite rock uh, formation that's up there. And when he goes for that round top, I'm not going to doubt anybody that it is, it's good high ground. I mean, you know I mean, little round top, but the problem is, is like a lot of people mistake it because there's this nice road now that gets up there. The only actual road, like you couldn't farm the round top. So just like Culp's Hill, the round tops, you're using that stuff as like wood lots. So there's on the, on the East back side, there's a way to get up, but it's just like a logging road to get up there to access. So this is not going to be an easy feat for the Confederacy to get through Devil's Den. Plus, like you know, you've got that that salient that they created. You know what I mean? So you got folks. So this is where in the readings in the books, man, this is where you're going to get in to the peach orchard and the wheat field and Devil's Den, and it's like you're just like orbiting this giant hairball, man. I mean, it's just a conglomeration, man. Of like, this, things are not going well uh, for both sides uh, of the armies, um, and and as they they start approaching, like when you look at the wheat field, you know, and, and if we want to talk about like the the wheat field, the amount of of just utter destruction in the wheat field, it was said that the wheat field you couldn't walk across the wheat field without stepping on a body. I mean, that's the type of carnage. Yeah, and the wheat field is big. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the wheat field is probably five or maybe, I mean, maybe 10 football fields across. Maybe it's like a thousand yards, but I mean, it's a big chunk yeah. of land. Yeah, it's a big chunk of land, man. Over. Yeah, and there's a, and there, I mean, it, and it's because now people are just starting to disobey orders, man. They're just not doing what they're told. I mean, you know, you start off with sickles. You know what I mean? Just not doing, just blatantly, just not doing what he's told. How hard is it? Cemetery Ridge. Got it. Put your line there. Because if he would have been where he was supposed to be, like literally when Longstreet tried to do this flank attack, and and if they would have gone through the peach orchard and there would just been like a few dudes there, they literally would have exposed their entire right flank to the Cemetery Ridge because it's deceiving looking from Seminary Ridge over to Cemetery Ridge. It's deceiving there. You know what I mean? There, you don't see the wheat field. You don't see Devil's Den. You don't see Plum Run. You can't see any of that. So Lee and them are just assuming that that cemetery ridge is right up there next to the peach orchard. They're assuming that. But it's actually back three quarters, which no offense. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you just can't see. Mm-hmm. You're just, you make a call and you go do it. So these guys are doing this. So that's how we end up to where at, at that point in time, uh, it, it's almost like what's taking place on day one up on Culp's Hill. There's nobody up there. Nobody uh, up on the round tops. On the round top. The like, round top's prominent terrain feature at the south end of the Union line yep. is these prominent terrain features, and there's no one on them. Yeah, because he doesn't have enough bodies, you know what I mean, yet to come in to occupy all of it. You know what I mean? And again, if you control the round top, like you said, you just control the round top. You don't control the road network. You know what I mean? So Meade, it's more important controlling Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and that road network. <clears throat> but he still has to worry about, you don't want to give that up because now you're going to lose a lot right there uh, at the edge. So there, it is occupied. And it's occupied by a guy by the name of Governor Warren. Occupied by one dude. Yeah, one dude, and he's got his signalman with him. So he's got some dude with flags. Two dudes. Yeah, he's got two dudes with flags. Uh, so... Warren, like when you get up there, uh, up onto the little round top, and, and you know they got that cool little statue of Warren standing up there. He's a he's a chappy looking fellow. Uh, you know what I mean? He's got his little binos and stuff, and he's standing up there on the rock. But that's a great viewpoint 
of the entire south end of the battlefield, man. You can see over Devil's Den. You can see down into the wheat field. You can see up to the peach orchard. So, I mean, you've got a great viewpoint. So And, and he's the chief engineer, and he's a good friend of George Gordon Meade. So he's a directed telescope for Meade. And he's up there because they use the wigwag signal, you know what I mean, kind of stuff. So it's just like baseball. Uh, you know what I mean? They're doing signals. And and uh, and everybody's always trying to figure out each other's signals. Uh, you know what I mean? They could have done a Houston Astros and beat on some shit cans or something. Whatever it takes to win. You know what I mean? Like, okay. So he gets that. So he's going to do whatever it takes to win. And he's standing up there and he's like, dude, he can see Hood and these guys coming. I mean, it's very blatant. You can just see it. So he sees this, and he looks at his signal guys, and he's like, hey, dude, just start waving your flags like there's a lot of shit going on. And the dudes are like, so he doesn't really mean it? Nope, I don't care. It just start waving flags. So they start waving flags. Well, if they can see the Confederates, then the Confederates can see them up there. And especially if you're standing on a little round top waving flags, everybody's going to see you. But if they see you waving flags, you're kind of like, hey, boss, Jocko, do you see that shit? They're waving the shit out of those flags. What do they mean, J.D.? I I don't know, but it must be something because they're waving them a lot. And at that time, then, you know, so he's got a yacht. He gets a sticky out talking about Governor Warren. Uh, He's going to send a note back to Meade. So he sends a note with a courier back to Meade basically saying, we need to get some bodies up here on Little Round Top, man. Like now, like these guys are coming. You need to get bodies. And of course, like we said, Meade's got other stuff going on as well, but he trusts Warren. And when he sees that note, he sends it over because he's sending resources of of some of the other corps that are coming in because he's sending folks into the wheat field and into the peach orchard to get sickles back. You know what I mean? This is like that that rescue effort Mm -hmm. to get sickles and third corps back. So he sends a note, and as the note, if you could always imagine, like you got this this teenager riding around on a pony, and he's looking for a general officer. So he's looking for this general officer, and he can't. And this dude by the name of of Strong Vincent, who's a brigade guy, sees this guy riding around. He's got this note, and he's Vincent. Strong Vincent is supposed to be taking his folks with his brigade. They're supposed to be heading over to the wheat field, right? So on his way to the wheat field, but he sees this kid come by. And he's like, hey, dude, give me that note. And he sees the note, and it's, and he reads it. And he's like, this is from Mead. Mead's approval. We need to get bodies up onto the round top like now. So he makes a decision without anybody else, and he's going to take his folks, and he's going to take them up and around. And Strong Vincent is now going to occupy the round top, little round top. And he's going to bring them up in behind so that he's not exposing them on the front. So he takes them on that eastern slope and he brings them up onto the approach of Little Round Top and it just takes action. Now, uh, you know, so again, he's supposed to be in the wheat field because this is going to this is going to have a little bit of effect later on. He's supposed to be in the wheat field, but he ends up going up and occupying. He just takes action and he goes up and, and he's going to occupy uh, little round top. Yeah, and you know we talk about like what this effort, what it, what it's like walking, and um, going going back just to hear a first person account, going back to Elijah Hunt Rhodes again for from all for the Union, and he's he's rolling in. I mean these guys, you guys are living through campaign and battle after battle. Here he is rolling in to Gettysburg. He says this on the night of July first. We were in camp near Manchester, Maryland. Rumors of fighting in Pennsylvania have been heard all the days, but the distance was so great to the battlefield that we knew little about it. The men were tired and hungry and lay down to rest early in the evening. At nine o'clock, orders came for us to move, and we in great haste packed up and started on the road towards Pennsylvania. General Hooker had has been relieved and General George G. Meade of Pennsylvania assigned to command the Army of the Potomac. What does it all mean? Well, it is none of our affairs and we obey orders and march out into the road. We struggle on through the night. The men almost dead f- for lack of sleep and falling over their own shadows, but still we go on in the warm summer night. 
Little is said by anyone, for we are all too weary to talk. Only now and then an officer sharply orders the men to close up. Sometimes the column would halt for a moment as obstructions were met in the advance and then we would run to catch up. Daylight brought no halt and what little hard bread we had was taken from the haversacks and eaten on as we marched. On the morning of July 2nd, we heard the firing in the front and then we understood the reason for such great haste. I was taken sick upon the road and fell helpless to the ground. The surgeon, Dr. Carr, gave me a remedy and a pass for admittance to an ambulance. I lay upon the roadside until several regiments had passed when I began to revive. I immediately hurried on and soon came up with my company B. The boys received me well and I went on without further trouble. The firing in our front grew loud and more distinct and soon we met the poor wounded fellows being carried to the rear. At a place called Littlestown, we saw large numbers of our wounded men and all kinds of carriages were being used to take them to the hospitals. At about two o'clock p.m., we reached the battlefield of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, having made a march of 34 miles without a halt. The men threw themselves upon the ground exhausted but were soon ordered forward. We followed the road blocked with troops and trains until 4 p.m. when the field of battle with the long lines of struggling weary soldiers burst upon us. With loud cheers, the old 6th Corps took up and double quick and were soon in the line of battle near the left of the main line held by the 5th Corps. The 5th Corps were in reserve, but as soon as we took their place, they moved forward and took part in the fight. Our division was finally sent to the front and relieved General Skyke's division of regulars. Picket firing was kept up until long after dark when we were relieved and returned a short distance. The men threw themselves upon the ground and oblivious to the dead and dying around us, we slept the sleep of the weary. So that's what these guys, that's what, that's what this is like. That's what these guys are going through. Um, as they, as they go into battle. And as you said, you got strong Vincent. He's moved. He, he takes the initiative to go and take the round tops, take little round top, which is the one that they can take. He's assigned to him as the 20th main under Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, and he's assigned by Vincent to hold the left flank. And we need to go to Chamberlain himself to hear, hear what that was like for him. So here we go with Chamberlain. And he says this, passing to the southern slope of Little Round Top, Colonel Vincent indicated to me the ground my regiment was to occupy, informing me that this was the extreme left flank of our general line and that a desperate attack was expected in order to turn that position, concluding by telling me that I was to hold that ground at all hazards. This was the last word I heard from him. My line formed, I immediately detached Company B, Captain Morell commanding to extend from my left flank across this hollow as a line of skirmishers with directions to act as occasion might dictate to prevent a surprise on my exposed flank and rear. In the midst of this, an officer from my center informed me that some important movement of the enemy was going on in his front beyond that line beyond that of a line with which we were engaged. Mounting a large rock, I was able to see a considerable body of the enemy moving by the flank in the rear of their line engaged and passing from the direction of the foot of the great round top through the valley toward the front of my left. We opened a brisk fire at close range, which was so sudden and effective that they soon fell back among the rocks and low trees in the valley, only to burst forth again with a shout and rapidly advanced, firing as they came. 
They pushed up to within a dozen yards of us before the terrible effectiveness of our fire compelled them to break and take shelter. They renewed the assault on our whole front, and for an hour the fighting was severe. Squads of the enemy broke through our line in several places, and the fight was literally hand to hand. It did not seem possible to withstand another shock like this now coming on. Our loss had been severe. One half of my left wing had fallen and a third of my regiment lay behind us, dead or badly wounded. At this moment, my anxiety was increased by a great roar of musketry in my rear on the farther or northerly slope of Little Round Top, apparently on the flank of the regular brigade, which was in support of Hazlitt's battery on the crest behind us. The bullets from this attack struck into my left rear, and I feared that the enemy might have nearly surrounded the Little Round Top, and only a desperate chance was left for us. My ammunition was soon exhausted. My men were firing their last shot and getting ready to club with their muskets. It was imperative to strike before we were struck by this overwhelming force in a hand-to-hand fight which we could not probably have withstood or survived. At that crisis, I ordered the bayonet. The word was enough. It ran like fire along the line from man to man and rose into a shout with which they sprang forward upon the enemy, now not 30 yards away. The effect was surprising. Many of the enemy's first line threw down their arms and surrendered. An officer fired his pistol at my head with one hand while he handed me his sword with the other. Holding fast by our right and swinging forward our left, we made an extended right wheel before the enemy's second line broke and fell back, fighting from tree to tree, many being captured until we had swept the valley and cleared the front of nearly our entire brigade. Meantime, Captain Morell, with his skirmishes sent out from my left flank with some dozen or 15 of the U.S. sharpshooters who had put themselves under his direction, fell upon the enemy as they were breaking, and by his demonstrations as well as his well-directed fire added much to the effect of the charge. Having thus cleared the valley and driven the enemy up the western slope of the great round top not wishing to press so far as out to hazard the ground i was to hold by leaving it exposed to a sudden rush of the enemy i succeeded although with some effort to stop my men who declared they were on the road to richmond in getting the regiment into good order and resuming our original position 400 prisoners, including two field and several line officers, were sent to the rear. These were mainly from the 15th and 47th Alabama regiments with some of the 4th and 5th Texas. 150 of the enemy were found killed and wounded in our front. So there you go. And that resulted in, as he said, 150 enemy killed, about 400 prisoners. The 20th Maine had over 100 wounded, and they had 30 who were killed in action. And this is, uh, you know, Joshua Chamberlain is receives the Medal of Honor for this this bayonet charge, and that holds the flank. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just an incredible uh, of what uh, you know. One uh, for for strong Vincent. You know, he, he's a uh, he's a brigade commander as a colonel, uh, and and like I said, you know, he's supposed to go to the wheat field. And you know, when you read about Chamberlain, of why are they low on ammunition? Because their logistics chief thinks they're in the wheat field. So where are they sending logs to? Uh, you know what I mean, and, and it's no, that's no like nothing against like strong Vincent, man. I mean that's like the la- like these dudes like when I stand up there, man, and you, you just like when we're there, and you're you're looking down at Wheatfield Peach Orchard, like you know Devil's Den, Round Top, uh, you know what I mean, just all these events that's going on. Yeah, logistics is probably the last freaking thing on my mind, man. Uh, and you know when you uh, spoke in there of, of strong Vincent, I mean he gets killed. You know, he lose him up there, Patty O'Rourke with New York. 
you know, he goes down. I mean, there's carnage going on. I mean, the Alabamans and Texans, man, it's not like, I mean, they're attacking multiple times. And and you and I have walked up that, that same approach route uh, that the Texans and Alabama, that is not an easy route that I would want to take. Uh, I mean, it's just so on, on both sides, but man, you know, with the 20th main, uh, and then with like the, the captain Morrell and, you know, you, and you mentioned there, cause we didn't really talk about it uh, just because there, I mean, there's like so much yeah. stuff to talk about at Gettysburg, but yeah, there's Berdan sharpshooters, uh, that were over there on the South end of the battlefield. And there was also the first time that anybody was allowed to wear green uniforms was the Berdan sharpshooters. So that's where you get your army OD green comes from the Berdan sharpshooters. And these dudes could lay the wood with a rifle. Uh, and as they're, you know, sharpshooting against the Confederates, they're kind of making their way up and over the big round top because they don't want to come through friendly lines. You know, nobody wearing a green tree suit wants to go through friendly lines. It's just not a good idea, even still today. So they jump in and join in with Captain Morrell. So, I mean, just the actions of 20th Maine. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, you guys have heard uh, quite a bit about Chamberlain so far, not just at Gettysburg, but, uh, you know, at the other battles and stuff. I mean, th- this guy, to, to get folks to, to you know, do a ba- – where he only gets to say bayonet. <laughs> you know, and, uh, like, we encourage all of you all to, to make your way to Gettysburg and mount that rock. Mm-hmm. I mean, if there's like one rock that you want to get on, dude, dude, that's it. You know what I mean? Like, because you get a whole different perspective. Yeah. Like, just what is it? Like four feet up? Yeah, probably a four foot tall rock, and you can you're standing on the ground and you're looking, and you're like, well, I can, I'm not really sure what's over there. Can't really see this area. There's dead space over there. But then you step on that rock, and it just oh, totally changes your perspective. Yeah. You got you got to get on the rock. Yeah. Uh, and you might feel it a little bit too when you step oh, up on the rock. <laughs> dude, I love running to that rock. That's always, I mean, I love that rock. Uh, like you just said, I mean, there's so much going on. And, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier when I was talking about uh, uh, Rhodes' book. Like, he, he throws out a sentence that's like, you know, we fought in the woods for an hour at close fire and hand to hand combat. Like, that's happening all over the place like like for for like a couple square miles is people engaged in close combat heroics at all kinds of different levels uh and and when you start talking about heroics that we can't talk about all of them but you got to talk about the first minnesota right i mean you you just have to talk about the first minnesota and what they did because you got as this as this echelon attack is happening it's in some places is working. Oh yeah, especially people that stuck with the plan because there's some people that didn't it decided not to execute. You know, you were talking about the morale earlier, and you know you had Longstreet that's kind of executed, but kind of like did it on a slow roll. The original an original plan. You got some of these Confederate forces that are like, oh, we're, we're not going. Oh we're, it, it, yeah, we're not going. Yeah, some of them went. Some of them made progress. Uh, there's a brigade from Georgia that actually starts to break through and is making their way up up cemetery, up towards cemetery ridge like they're going to get there oh yeah like i mean it's i mean th- they're there uh and when you stand it cuz it's like really flat right there at that area you know what i mean and it's not it's not very pro- but it is when you go to the east it does drop off pretty prominently back there to that road and like you said this draw play uh, on this massive scale is working. Uh, so, yeah, these George guys, they're going to start seeing it. And now, now we're over in uh, over in the in the second core area, and that's Hancock. Mm-hmm. So this is like his area of line of responsibility. But they're also, you know, I mean, there's like you said, man, there's just so much stuff going on. Because, oh, by the way, while that draw play is going on, then what's going to kick off over here towards the Culp's Hill? Well, now here comes Meade. I mean, you know, Meade's got to deal with these guys because he's got Yule that's now going to start executing his draw play. Uh, so it's just like, holy shit, man. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of stuff going on. And as as Hancock is riding the lines, you know what I mean? He's up and like, and everybody, like, I mean, when you when you get the picture of the 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 Union generals 
uh, at Gettysburg, even on day two, man. Like, it's not like you got to go far to find one. They're all up there on the line. Like, I mean, it's, you know, you got folks moving in and around, pulling troops, pushing troops, because it's chaos. And Hancock sees to where these folks are about ready. They're, they're getting up onto the Cemetery Ridge. And as more resources are pulling up, here comes this unit, and it's the 1st Minnesota. Uh, and and as far, and 1st Minnesota, I mean, pull the string on those guys. They're the reason why they're first. They are the first regiment from the state of Minnesota. These dudes have been in the war since the beginning. They are a very proud unit uh, from Minnesota. Uh, and there's there's some people that think that if it wasn't for the first Minnesota, you know what I mean, it could have been a different outcome, uh, definitely uh, with the Battle of Gettysburg for what these guys. So how they end up uh, getting into this uh, – Winfield Scott is seeing this, and he knows that it's going to be a disaster. And he and he looks over, uh, and and he sees, and he's he yells down at, at the Minnesota. He doesn't know who they are, but he just sees a freaking regiment of it, and he's like, "Who who is that?" And of course, Colville, the Colonel, First Minnesota. You know what I mean? He's like, like, of course it is the First Minnesota. Like these dudes are like First Minnesota. And he looks and he says, "You see those colors pointing at the Georgians." Right, he's pointing at them. You know what I mean? You see, take those colors, and I mean, so, so the Minnesota, and it's not going to go. You got you know, the first, just to, just to throw some numbers out. Yeah, here. throw some numbers. I mean, well, how how many uh, how many guys we got in the first Minnesota at this point? Like two hundred and fifty. Yeah, just less than three hundred. And and how many are in this brigade of Georgians? Thousand. Yeah, close to a thousand. You know, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Go to the numbers because at the beginning of the war, like a regiment's supposed to have a thousand people. Dude, we're in '63. Yeah. We've had a lot. There's not a thousand people. They got just under three hundred. Well, as you just covered, I mean, it's like it just go, going back to the book Gettysburg here. Uh, Hancock broke from his thoughts and looked at the first Minnesota as if for the first time. My God, he exclaimed, "Are these all the men we have here?" He demanded to know and was told the regiment's name, Colonel. Do you see those colors? He asked Colville. Colville, like you said, is the Minnesota commander, pointing to the name, pointing to some of the rebel battle flags bobbing among Wilcox's brigade. When Colville said he did, Hancock gave his orders: then take them. The first Minnesota moved down the gentle slope, bayonets fixed, a line of battle perhaps a hundred yards from end to end. The soldiers came under fire right away. Men stumbled and fell, recalled an officer uh, in those ranks. Some stayed down, but others got up and continued. The charging line of Minnesotans drove into the advance screen of Will Cox's brigade and hustled it back to a second line, which fell back to the main body. This last, some 1,000 strong, was not going to be scattered by 250 or so Yankees. The men of the first Minnesota halted along the dry stream bed of Plum Run, firing for all they were worth. A torrent of Confederate rifle fire lashed into the Yankee regiment from Wilcox's men in, f- in their front and from some of the Lang's Florida troops who got an enfilade position. After enduring a few minutes of this, the Union survivors ran back to Cemetery Ridge. This was the final straw for Cadmus Wilcox. His request for reinforcements had not been answered and both his flanks were exposed. Without support on either my right or left, he reported, my men were withdrawn to prevent their entire destruction or capture. And the Minnesota, I mean, they took like somewhere around 80% losses. Yeah, yeah, it's anywhere between 80-83%. And, and you know what they were most proud of? Everybody was present. Nobody stayed back. I mean, the Minnesota one goes, man, they all win. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, it, and that, that monument that's there for the first Minnesota, because, you know, it's, it's right there next to the biggest monument on the freaking battlefield, you know, that big white domey thing of Pennsylvania, because <laughs> the Pennsylvanians are proud of their boys that fought there, which, yeah, of course, uh, but that Minnesota man, it's, it's just it's it's a cool monument just because it's just one rifleman, 
and he's like, you know, he's carrying his rifle, and he's kind of like bent over, like he's in that charge, man. And it's just one dude, man, running right into that melee, and and he's representing like all of Minnesota. I mean, it's a, uh, it's just, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, like you said, I mean, there's just so many acts uh, of just complete, just bravery and leadership. I mean, we could spend just years up there. Uh, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, so yeah. Um, well, lo- you know, the Minnesota, the first Minnesota is able to stop. That's the closest that they get to breaking through the lines. And they were halted by these 250, 1,000 were stopped by 250 Minnesota. And and that was kind of the closest they got. Day This is day two. And that kind of closes out day two. Like this is, they're, they're kind of there. They're kind of back to home. They're back. They're kind of back to where they started. At the end of day two, really not not a lot of progress has been made. There's been a lot of fighting. There's been a lot of death. But you end up with, you know, Seminary Ridge. You end up with Lee and the and the Confederates over there on Seminary Ridge again. And on Cemetery Ridge, you got the fish hook. Uh, that's where you end up with at the at the end of at the end of day two. Now, worth mentioning. The Minnesota were close to breaking through, but also like in the center of the line where Lee was watching, there was another brigade that almost broke through, right? Yeah, he's he's over at his headquarters, and you could see. So as as he watches this this one brigade break through the lines there, you know what I mean, and like get into the line. I mean, these guys are in the lines with Minnesota in them. They're they're on seminary uh, on Cemetery Ridge. They're in the lines, and Lee. It has a profound effect. Uh, on Robert E. Lee, and just like you said, like you know, just like Hood going for the round tops, not doing what he's told. Some folks just decided, well, I'm just not going to attack, and you know, Cadness Wilcox has to pull back out. Same things happening over on Culp's Hill with that whole thing with Yule. Folks are just deciding, yeah, just not going to attack. You know what I mean? So this is like this is something. This hasn't happened in the Army of Northern Virginia, but yeah, Lee is observing. Uh, you know what I mean? And he sees this brigade that is successful. So Lee thinks, hmm, because as everybody's like pulling back, like you said, day two, we're done. So everybody's got to like get what they can and make their way back to their original starting positions. So literally, we're right back, like you had said, seminary, cemetery. Everybody's back to where they were, except now we've got folks occupying, and we're gonna we're gonna keep them up on the little round top. Like okay, well, once we got it, we're gonna keep it. Uh, so uh, good call. Uh, I don't want to give that up again, but you could imagine. I mean, there's a lot of loss. I mean, these armies are getting pretty wrecked. So the lines are going to start to get pretty thin. I mean, when you've got a regiment of 1st Minnesota and you're taking over 80% casualties, I mean, so the lines are getting thin. Uh, but, you know, the, the Union Army's got good resupply coming in. Now you got to look at the resupply that's coming in over with the Army of Northern Virginia. You know what I mean? I, I, they're getting kind of low. Mm-hmm. So Lee's got to come up with another plan and he's got to bring his corps commanders back in that night because he's got to issue another order, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so Lee, as he's observing the day battle, and he's got a pretty good vantage point to observe that, uh, he's like, dude, if one brigade can get through that line, what if I stuff 11 brigades through the center line? So here comes Pickett's charge. So that's why on day three, what he sees happen successfully on day two, I'm going to stuff 11 brigades right across that field, three quarters of a mile right in the middle. Frontal assault. Frontal assault, man. Uh, And, you know, so so you've got – Long Street in there. So I mean, you know how how that kind of went down on on uh, on July the second. Long Street when he showed up, he he wasn't on board with the plan, uh, and then goes out. You know, slow rolls, 
whatever, you know what I mean? It gets all the way out and around. It goes from 200 people into Peach Orchard, a couple of thousand people into Peach Orchard. Hood, Hood is, he's not doing what he's told. You got other guys that are refusing to advance. I mean, it's just like, what? what, 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 what yeah, like what's going on with the Army of Northern Virginia here? And, and now, I can only imagine. So Longstreet walks into the tent. He's like, hey, boss, yeah, but it wasn't a good day. Yep, no shit. Uh, but I could imagine like Longstreet, is might be looking at it like, what, what do you want to do today? And then Lee's going to say, I want to stuff 11 brigades. Yeah, you would think Longstreet would be like, hey, you know, boss, look, we, we took a crack at it. Might be a good idea. You remember what I was talking about a couple days ago? Like, how yeah. about we move somewhere else, get defensive? What do you think, boss? Like, this isn't working out too well. That's what I would be hoping for if I was Longstreet. Right. <laughs> but that's not what he gets. No. He gets, we're going to do a frontal assault. Straight, straight up the middle. So, you know, Longstreet pushes back against that plan. Yeah, and and luckily we got some documentation here. For, once again, going back to this book, Gettysburg. You know, if you, how strongly does he push back against you know General Lee, who is the Confederacy at this point? Right. Here's what Longstreet tells him, General. I have been a soldier all my life. I have been with soldiers engaged in fights by couples, by squads, companies, regiments, divisions, and armies, and should know as well as anyone what soldiers can do. It is my opinion that no 15,000 men ever arrayed for battle can take that position. And the next line in the book is Lee was unmoved. Yeah, unmoved. Which is crazy to think about. Like, this is, I mean, even guys that I didn't really, you know, if I had one of my subordinates come to me and say, hey, Jocko, look, the plan that you just came up with, I've been doing this for a while, this ain't gonna work. Even if I didn't know that, you know, even if my trust level was low, I'd be like, oh, damn. This is gonna make me reconsider some stuff. So the fact that Lee is just like unmoved, it's scary to think about. It's scary to think about. And I'll tell you what, when you go over and you stand on on the Confederate side and you look up across that field, uh, it's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. You got this big open field, there's barely any cover they got these um they got these fences right like these 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 fences out there that are going to bog you down the 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 unions in like a little bit of an elevated position where they're shooting down i mean it, it's it's a nightmare but that's the command yeah and and the the funny thing is is like even though longstreet makes that response and it's crazy that Lee is unmoved. And then who's he going to pick to be in charge of all of this? Longstreet. So, again, you got a guy that is not – like I mean, he's definitely not on board with the plan. So then he's got to go and he's got to coordinate with A.P. Hill because he's going to take some of his guys too. I mean, this is – like you said, I mean, it's over 12,000 people. I mean – when you look at that field, the the front it, like people think like when you think about it, oh, it's just Pickett's Charge. Yeah, they're all just going to be in this little tight. This, no, I mean, it's across the field frontage. Uh, you know what I mean? And they're going to come up out of like, okay, yeah, I'll give. There's a little bit of defilade. Yeah, there, there's some, some little areas. Little areas. But you better be skull dragging and wearing a ghillie suit, man, <laughs> like if you think you're going to get across that field. Unscathed. Yeah. And then, you know, we talk about like, uh, it, it's now you're coming into July 3rd. You've been out there fighting a battle for a couple of days, right? And and you've we don't have smokeless gunpowder yet either, do we? So there's no wind. It's freaking hot. It's humid. It's July. So all of that just smoke is just sitting in that low area across the fields. Because to kick this thing off, just like a lot of uh, infantry attacks kick off they kick it off with bombardment with a massive cannon bombardment and that that's what the that's what the confederates do but like you said 
Well, when you shoot a cannon, you look at where you hit and then you make some adjustments, right? Well, when everything is covered by smoke, you're only getting a couple rounds off before you can't really even see what you're shooting at anymore. Yeah, so your effective fire, like, you know, in today's day and age, dude, you could have like the artillery. Yeah, all the way back over in the Cumberland Valley, <laughs> and you got an FO guys, and we could be calling in Artie, and you you don't even know where they are. Yeah. Well, back then, this is just like a big ass rifle <laughs> on wheels. It's got like even a little peep sight, you know, what I mean? like on the front of it, and it's got like one of those little sulky, like sulky chairs, like on a tractor, you know what I mean? So you got the guy, and he's gonna sight the piece. So meaning, I got to be able to see Jocko. And I got to cite it. And then I got to, you know I mean? So there's a lot going on here. And then, you know, one of the other things that we didn't bring up that we always talk about when we're over on McPherson's Ridge of, of range estimation. You know what I mean? So you're talking about range estimation. And like nowadays, you know, we got like Leicas and cool stuff with like laser range finders. Like everybody's got one. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Back then, it's kind of like you're looking at it and it's like, you know, so you, like you got to look at like large objects. Well, in farmland, the most prominent features on these battlefields are barns, right? So you got a barn. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the barns, if you're from the south, the barns are like two-story, mm-hmm. right? You know what I mean? So when you're looking at, you're, you're, if you're from North Carolina, you're looking at a barn, and he, you know whether you're shooting a rifle or you're shooting an artillery piece, you're like, hey, that barn, you probably hold out your fingers. You're like, hey, for me, when I hold up my finger to a barn, if my if my finger can cover both stories, that's this m- many yards away. If it's a half of my finger, oh, it's this many yards away. If it's if it's really close, oh, that's it. It, it, it takes two fingers a cup. So you get a way to sense. Like the same thing happens with hunting, like elk, right? You, if you can. As often as you can, you go out and you look at and you shoot at life-size elk targets because after a while you go, oh, I can see, I can just a quick estimation like, oh, I can see how big it is just by understanding the size of an elk and how big it is in my vision right now. Okay, that thing's 80 yards away. Oh, look Look at this other one over here. Oh, that thing's this big in my vision. It's 40 yards away. So these these guys get used to, you're in the south, you're looking at a barn, you know that the thing's roughly, what, it's two stories, but it's 20 feet, 20, 22 feet. You know what it is, and you can ra- do range estimation on that. Right. So the Army of Northern Virginia has, how many times have they been north so far? Once. <laughs> For one day, right? And they got out. One day. And they only saw a couple of barns. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so now they're back up there again. Well, you know what I mean? I, I, I live in Virginia. The barns in Virginia are smaller than the barns in Gettysburg because it gets cold up there. So they've got that bottom story to where they can put the livestock underneath there. And when we're out there at, at like McPherson's Ridge, because we always go back and around the backside of the barn, and you can now see it. You know what I mean? So range estimation is going to be a big deal. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's called a miss. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it appears to be closer. So you're going to short round it. You know what I mean? And these guys are only three quarters of a mile. So it doesn't matter if you're the green tubes, you know, that are out there or the Napoleon style artillery, still three quarters of a mile. The black tubes are painted black because they're steel. So for erosion, those are still a mile, a mile and a half guns. You know what I mean? But you still have to see. You know what I mean? And you're still going to cut for the range estimation of how far you want this big, massive ball to blow up, right? So it's going to be off. So that's going to be a huge effect on the Army of Northern Virginia as well. And they're just going to, yeah, they're going to start with that artillery barrage. And then it's, here comes Pickett's Charge. Pickett's Charge is, like you said, it's 12,500 men. They're going. On, look, is there some is there some places to hide along the way? Is there is there a, a, a little knoll to get behind? Is there some dead space you can work through? Yes, but eventually, if you're going to move forward, you're going to have to get up and you're going to out of that. So there's very little cover. There's not even that much concealment. It's three quarters of a mile. There's these split rail fences that you're bogged down on. You have to 
either break it, which is going to take you time, or you got to climb over it. Now you're even more exposed. And this just turns into a, a, a death march as they move forward. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, as they now, do they make it all the way across the field? Yeah. Uh, some of them do. Some of them, but um, it's not enough to to make any matter. And and uh, a, a lot of folks, you know, when you read, you always get to the you know the the high water mark of the Confederacy that's over there, and and it's not. It's just like that. It's that little bitty white like marble looking, like looks like a scroll, mm-hmm. and that is where like what makes it uh, even even more famous is that's where Armistead and Hancock, they're friends. So that's where Armistead falls and dies, and literally Hancock comes out. But that that high water mark of the of the Confederacy, that's as far north as they ever got. Yeah, and, and uh, like it's a death, it's a field of death. But like you said, some of them do make it. There's hand to hand combat, and you know you go there. It's amazing because you're like standing at the stone wall where. Some of the Confederates made it over that wall. They're in there. They're killing each other with bayonets. It's like the fact that they made it that far is incredible. But once they got there, th- th- that was it. The guys that made it there were the guys that made it there. There was no one else coming. Yeah, no, yeah, nobody. And and the thing about it is, like at that high water mark, how how far would you say we're actually from Meade's headquarters? Five hundred yards? No more than five hundred yeah. yards. I mean, it's like literally right yeah. over the military crest. Right, <laughs> you're there. I mean, that's how close these dudes are. And it, it yeah, it, it looks like, like nowadays, I mean, it's just like, just, I mean, it's a beautiful battlefield park. But I mean, that day at the end of Pickett's Charge, man, of what's taking place in the center of those lines is just freaking carnage, uh, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was game on. So that, yeah, so when you, when you go there, when you hear the, the referral of, of the high watermark and the, and the cops of trees, uh, that people talk about those cops of trees are just like a, just a little bit off to the left of the high water mark. It's just like this, uh, and it, you can't miss it because the Park Service put a big like wrought iron fence around the cops of trees. Those cops of trees is where it's a, it's supposed to be the trees that are high enough. Because like when Jocko and I were kind of talking a little bit earlier about like you can't really see stuff, but the trees are up above all the smoke and stuff, so it's giving you a guide. So while you're trying to get across this field, you can at least see those trees in the distance. And there's debate over whether or not it was those cops of trees or whether it doesn't make a shit. You know what I mean? There, there's trees and it's like a guiding because once they go, it's like as everybody goes towards the cops of trees, that's why everybody's kind of funneling in to that center of the line. And then that's where you get the high water mark of the Confederacy. So that's how, like, when you're reading through the book and you're trying to, like, kind of figure out in your head of, like, what's going on, you know, if you if you, you know, if you come out to Gettysburg and, and you, you see it, like, all of it just, bam, just comes right to you. And it's amazing, uh, you know what I mean, that, you know, that's pretty much the end of day three, you know what I mean? Uh, and then you, you've got the high water mark, and then you're looking at the casualties of that day. With the, you know, you're starting out, you get, you're sending across 12,500 folks. I mean, that's a lot of people, but you could imagine at the end of, of day three, man, of the Battle of Gettysburg. Yeah, I mean, just, just, just on that, it's 1,123 killed, 4,000 wounded, so like half, and 3,750 captured. So more than half of your troops are gone. Um, or they're at least casualties that aren't going to be able to fight anymore. And, you know, you, you, th- it's so frustrating when you look at that battlefield and, you know, you understand, you know, we, this, is, this is about leadership and just that, to, to know that the relationship wasn't there, you know, when, again, look, if you're a historian and you want to pull up some letters that I don't know about, okay, from my perspective, as I look at the relationship between Longstreet and Lee, they didn't have a good enough relationship where, where Lee is going to listen to Longstreet and say, hey, I'm giving you the strongest 
possible personal recommendation not to do this. And Lee says, no, we're doing it. And, and then you just send you know, half of your men to be wounded, killed, or captured. Uh, it's, it's a horrible thing to look at. And it's, it's a, a very depressing thought from a leadership perspective. So, yeah, like you said, I mean, this is, the, after that, the, the Confederate moves back and, and basically day, the next day they get up and they start their retreat to the South. And I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln's fired up. He's like, hey, pursue. <laughs> and Meade's like, yeah, boss, okay. You know, we'll do our best. But I mean, there's, the, the, the casualties on the Union side are absolutely immense. And so it's a win. It's, a, it's, it's definitely a win for the Union. Now, interestingly, you would think that this would be the big news of the day. You, you would know, think. You would think that this would be the big news of the day. General Lee, the most respected military commander out there on either side, just got defeated. The people that are on, the, the Confederates who have been on a winning streak, winning streak, winning streak, winning streak, all of a sudden they've been defeated. You would think that this would be the big story. But the big story actually isn't Gettysburg. The big story is what happens on July 4th in Vicksburg, and that is that Vicksburg Falls. It's been under siege, and Vicksburg Falls. Uh, Grant, (laughs) our boy Grant is out there, and he's like proven his leadership skills, and this puts, you know, Grant, or puts Lincoln to a position. He's, you know, he's paying attention. See who's got it that's out there kicking ass, and he's starting to see Grant as a guy that's out there kicking ass, and Lincoln's thinking, I'm gonna bring this guy back east, and, and, let him take over all the armies. Uh, so even though, but even though this wasn't the story of the day, um, certainly this became, this battle became legend. And, you know, years later, at a dedication uh, to a memorial to the 20th Maine on Little Round Top, uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, he, he gave a speech up there. And this this speech, you know, just to give a little, a little small excerpt of this speech, of what he said. He said this, <clears throat> we rose in soul above the things which even the Declaration of Independence pronounces the inalienable rights of human nature for the securing of which governments are instituted among men. Happiness, liberty, life we laid on the altar of offering or committed to the furies of destruction while our minds were lifted up to a great thought and our hearts swelled to its measure. We were beckoned on by the vision of destiny. We saw our country moving forward, charged with the sacred trusts of man. We believed in its glorious career, the power of high aims and strong purpose, the continuity of great endeavor, the onward, upward path of history to God. Every man felt that he gave himself to and belonged to something beyond time and above place, something which could not die. So all those things that in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, these men on that ground put all those things on the altar of sacrifice. And yet despite all that suffering and all that sacrifice, the war was not over. Then there would be more suffering and there would be more sacrifice required in order to preserve the Union. And we will continue that on the next Civil War excursion. And that's the plan. So we've got to July of 1863. We have, we have to go all the way until April of 1865. Um, 
it's going to start to turn into the Lee versus Grant story. We're going to start seeing Sherman back in the game. Uh, we've been here. JD and I have been here uh, for a week out in, out here in San Diego, California doing this. Uh, we, we aren't going to be able to do this immediately. But the plan is in the next several months we'll come out and we'll give you the second half of what's going on. The second half of how this unfolds. Some of these details, some of these lessons learned. You know, you know, JD, it's uh, so awesome to be able to sit here with you because, you know, I, I, I'm a jujitsu guy. Probably if there's, well, I guess I know, I know probably the best skill I have or no, the, the most knowledge I have is probably about maneuvering elements on a battlefield, small elements on the battlefield. That's probably the most knowledgeable thing I have because that was my profession for a long time. But jujitsu is right up there. And like when I'm learning jujitsu, if I'm learning a new move and, and somebody shows me something, for me, because I have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge and a lot of context, I can take that move and I can incorporate it usually pretty quick. And what I love about uh, having you here is the context that you have around this information is like incredible. <laughs> And it's not just a, it's not, what, what I really like about it, it's not just a mental picture that you have. You don't just have like, hey, I know this character, I know that character. You have an unmatched terrain association where where when when we're talking about a place on the battlefield, you are you know that place. You've been in that place. You've you've been in that place. Like when we're talking about Vicksburg, we just threw a random, a random shot. Vicksburg, we haven't talked about Vicksburg yet. We just throwing a random thing out there about Vicksburg the siege ending and the Confederacy falling. You're like, you know where that happened. You've walked those grounds. You've been through that. So it's awesome to be able to sit here and have you share that context and all these different things, man. So I appreciate you coming out to do this. I appreciate you having me out, man. This is a you know, huge, uh, great experience, man, being on here. And, and again, you know, uh, uh, like I've told you numerous times, you, you know, when you read Chamberlain and the folks that are out there and the characters that we're talking about, I mean, these are great Americans, man. Like, everybody in America should know who John frickin' Buford is, man. They should know Chamberlain. They should know Meade. You know, as many times as, like, we've done staff rides together, and, you know, like, the, the first day when everybody gets there, first thing we're always like is, like, hey, put your hand in the air if you know who George Gordon Meade is. Nobody puts their hand in the air. I say, well, who knows Robert E. Lee? The whole room goes up, and it's like he beat Robert E. Lee here. <laughs> like he fought for the Union, man. Like Meade, you know what I mean? Is a great guy. Hancock. You know, I mean, we talked about that stuff earlier today. Like, I mean, you don't know who hand. I mean, these are just great Americans. So, I mean, dude, well, I love being on here with you, man. And 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 you know, folks can learn, and hopefully, you know get these books man and read through them i mean they are just phenomenal yeah a caveat that i should have put out like on the first one that we did is you know look first of all we can't cover everything you know we we just can't cover everything and we know that there's stuff we're skipping over we know that there's letters that were written that we didn't there's just all this stuff to to go through and you could see i mean we're, we're on gettysburg today this was we're at three hours and 42 minutes by the way right now so three hours and 42 minutes we could have done this we could have done seven eight hours on it i mean when we go to the battlefield when we go to gettysburg we do eight hours a day plus dinner plus bre like we're just it's like 28 hours of freaking gettysburg just gettysburg so that's the caveat also look look like obviously i'm th i'm not a, i'm much less knowledgeable than you. I'm throwing in my spin. So if anyone's mad that I said Lee thought this or or you know Longstreet thought that or Chamberlain should have done this, my, I apologize for my opinions. That's my assessment. Um, sorry. You know, don't don't subscribe. You know, <laughs> I, but those are my hey, it's my podcast. I'll have my opinions. <laughs> <laughs> but but honestly, not that it's my podcast. I'll have my opinions. But for me, I always want to know from a leadership perspective, from a human nature perspective, what can I glean from what I see? And if I'm not trying to figure it out, well, then I'm not, in my opinion, I'm not trying to put my context around. I don't have the context that you have around the, 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 the actual characters, the actual terrain. But I got care, you know, I've got my context of interacting with a bunch of people for a long time. 
So I apologize to anyone out, out there that's mad about some take I had on something. Uh, that's my take, man. And hey, if I'm, I look for, I'm sure a lot of people will reach out and say, hey, you know, Lee never would have said that because of X. I will appreciate that feedback. I'm open to, I'm obviously open to it. I know I don't know everything. Uh, but seriously, there's so many lessons to learn in these and, and going to these places. Look, do you, you want to come and go through one of these battlegrounds with Echelon Front? Sure. Do you want to go with OMNA International, which is JD's company? Sure. If you don't go with us, you don't need us there. I would just encourage you to go out walk these battlefields i mean this when you look at the elevation the elevated vision that chamberlain has of this country and you realize that's what these guys were striving for now look was every private striving for this elevated vision no no i get that is every you know lance lance corporal in the marine corps is every private in the army got this elevated vision of 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 america and that's what they're fighting for no not all of them but I'll tell you what, you take a unit and that elevated vision of America is there. And that's what these men fought for. And so you go out, pay respect on these battlefields, and you're gonna take away something, not just about leadership, not just about combat, but you're gonna learn to appreciate what sacrifices were made so that we could carry on this incredible nation that we have. Anything else, JD? No, that's that's it, man. Love it. Awesome. That's the plan, everybody. We'll see you in a few months for the rest of the Jocko Excursion Civil War podcast with JD Baker. In the meantime, if you want to support, go to JockoStore.com, JockoFuel.com, OriginUSA.com, EchelonFront.com, the O-M-N-A.com. We appreciate it. And until next time, stay free. This is JD and Jocko.